the co-host and she has she has Garth's computer. Yeah, it's Garth's on board. And I just started um uh recording. recording. Yeah. Yeah, let me um get to it real quick. And Jen, I will be looking for Laura. Okay. So a few minutes late if you can help me and let her in. Absolutely. That would be great. Is Laura the only one we're missing right now? As far as board members. Okay. I've noticed every other board member. So All right. well, there, let me you're on is it G Altenberg on there? Uh, it says Garth Altenberg under my Okay. My computer see. sets, but G Altenberg would make sense too. All right. No, just, it's Garth, yeah. And there you are. Okay, so make co host. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. No. Thank <laughs> you. Well, so I think we'll get started. Does that sound good to you, Donna? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, I just want to say welcome to everybody to the Cape Elizabeth School Board business meeting on Tuesday, August 17th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. Um, we could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and Donna, can we use that flag of yours? Sure, you can see it. It's not blowing tonight. That's okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Um, before we get started, um, I would just like to remind everybody just a little um, detail about Zoom that if you are not currently speaking, if you can please remember to have your phone on mute or your computer on mute so that there's no background noise. Um, and um, I want to apologize. I don't have a printer where I am in my agenda the best I can, but if it looks like I'm having a hard time, that might be a little bit. Um, so first off, we have added last minute. Um, actually, are there any adjustments to the agenda? I would like to see if there's any adjustments first. If so, please raise your hand. Um, okay. And then um, it doesn't look like there are. So um, next up, uh, we have a presentation by our Cape Elizabeth, um, Cape Elizabeth School District Physician Smita Santi, um, Dr. Santi. Um, she practices, med she's the practicing medical director at Martins Point in Gorham and Scarborough Practices. Is that correct, Samita? Thank yes. you so much for being here. Welcome. You have the floor. So thank, thank you. you thank you, everyone. And um, thank you for your time today. I just have a, a few quick thoughts um, just that I put together as we think about how to approach the fall, um, just from my perspective. And to give you a little background, um, in my role, I've been working quite a bit with our COVID response as an organization and sort of have been involved in many aspects of it. And so as I just look at the schools, I try to, to you know, use that same frame of reference for that. Um, so I just wanted to re read some of my thoughts and then I'm happy to answer some questions. I know you all have a big um, task ahead and have been working very hard to figure out what's best for um, the, the community. So um, I certainly appreciate that difficulty. Uh, and it is a really challenging one across the country. Um, looking at our own state, we have some data to guide our decision and our relative comfort with returning to school in some capacity this fall. The state has noted that all counties are either yellow or green, which is, supports reopening in, in some capacity. And there's some other epidemiological data that I have been reviewing and we've been using for our organization. It's through the Harvard, Harvard Global Health Institute. I'd be happy to share the website if you aren't familiar with it. That notes that Maine as a state and Cumberland County in particular are low or yellow. They have one point, we have 1.3 new cases per 100,000, which is extremely low. And that just um, you know, shows the, the excellent work our state has been doing in our communities. And it really provides a good foundation with which to look at um, the relative safety of reopening. I know you guys have been wrestling with a lot of questions around um, the operationalize, 
operationalization of opening, which is really a challenge. And in my view, the priority of sort of factors that we can look at are, of course, um, you all are very familiar with them, but I'll sort of review them in, in priority for me is really the face mask and hand hygiene. The studies really locally, internationally, et cetera, have noted that those are really the critical um, pieces in reducing infection spread. Um, physical distancing is next, and that also is a, an important piece in reducing it in an indoor setting. And the appropriate screening and education um, on when students and staff can return to school and when they should stay at home if they are symptomatic. Um, and cleaning and, disinfect and disinfection of surfaces. And um, an issue that's come up for you all, and I know you will dive into it later um, on uh, at great length is ventilation. And um, just from my medical perspective, I tried to look at the data and the CDC really has very limited information on this. Um, there's basically one paragraph that just says, ensure ventilation systems in schools operate properly and increase circulation of outdoor air as much as possible. For example, opening doors and windows. Um, and so that's basically all we got from, from their general resource. And other data from the CDC indicates acceptable air exchanges of six to 12 per hour, which you all may be reviewing as well. And I really, I'm no ventilation expert, so I certainly couldn't comment on that. And I know that there's a lot of work um, to be done potentially in that area. But um, if there are concerns in that area alone and all other areas of infection control can be mitigated by the things that we're talking about today, to me, that seems to be not the only factor, um, meaning that the other factors may be um, critically important. So, um, and I tried to look at a lot of research and a lot of articles, both across the US and internationally as they open, as schools have been opening up. And in my review, the primary areas of focus that ensure safest return are universal masking, hand hygiene, and the physical distancing. And that order. And I've been in contact with some other school physicians um, in the community, both at Martins Point and um, in the state, and many of us sort of agree that if we do have those practices in hand and infection control, um, that we can offer some model of, um, of learning that would allow students to return in some capacity. Um, and just as a follow-up, I, I have some conversations with a few uh, medical providers who are school physicians who are working with the state and their advisory board and we're meeting later this week. And so if I have any other additional information that may change um, what I may share with you today, I would certainly update um, Donna on that. Um, and so I would be glad to take other questions whenever you see fit, but I, I do think that um, we are really positioned well to um, offer as safe an experience as we can and knowing that that's not going to be a guarantee of safety, but um, certainly um, a, a very good start. So I will pause and um, you can certainly guide me if I need to answer questions now or at a later date. Yeah. Thank you for that update. Um, traditionally, this presentation would be a little further on in um, the meeting, but to accommodate um, uh, Dr. San Santi, we have moved it up. So the questions she's referring to are specific to board members at this point. Um, there will be public comment afterwards, but um, if board members have questions, please uh, raise your virtual hand and I can call on you. And I'm, I'm not seeing any, and sometimes it takes a minute for people to get around, but, um, okay. Um, it looks like there are none for you tonight. I wanna, again, thank you for coming and speaking tonight, for doing some of that research, for um, being an expert opinion um, in this difficult time. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, I'll stay on too as long as I can, and then I'll just sneak off. Okay. Okay, that is great. Um, next, we will have publics from the comment. I just want to remind people of some of the um, uh, some of the details of the um, comments from the public. They are three minutes. We're allotting twenty minutes, which is typical in our regular business meeting period. Um, we would uh, ask that you refrain from repetitive uh, comments that have already been stated if that is coming out. Um, and just a reminder that um, comments are just that, they're your comments, it's not engaging back and forth um, in the sense that it's not questions where uh, you will receive answers right away. Um, can Jen, if you're still there, can you remind the public how to raise their hand for me to be able to call on them? Yeah, I believe it's under your participants. 
So if you go under participants, you should see a spot where you can raise the hand. Um, and if you can, when you do speak, say your name and your address or where you're from, that would be appreciated. So if there's any comments, see Emily Garvin, you have the floor. Wait, can you hear me? I can, Emily. Okay. Um, I live at 76 Oakhurst Road. I have a sixth grader and a 10th grader. Um, and I want to thank you all for the work done this spring and summer by the school board and district employees. I wrote a letter to the school board yesterday that offers a bit of a different perspective than has been echoed in previous meetings or on social media. I'm choosing to read a more polished version of it tonight for the public's benefit. As parents and citizens have been publicly broadcasting their opinions, Via comment at meetings and on social media, it's easy to get mired down in contradicting articles, debates, and general frustration with the pace of decision making, whether at the federal, state, or local levels. I've been wading through it all with caution, trying to understand various perspectives. I'm speaking today, however, in an attempt to strip back all of that and get down to the basic decision before you, and more importantly, your role as Cape Elizabeth School Board in this decision. We are a public school, not a private school. You are elected officials, not CD doctors or scientists. I believe it is our local school board's job to ensure our district follows federal and state laws, rules, regulations, orders, mandates, and guidelines where education is concerned within local parameters, including our town's policies, facilities, talent, and tax revenue. We have a governor, a main state CDC, the Maine State DOE, all of which have directed the districts in our county to open schools to the fullest extent possible using CDC guidelines. These people have done the work. They've done the research. They are guiding us and providing strong leadership. I urge you to act as our school board and not Cape Elizabeth's local CDC. I urge you to begin the school year in a hybrid plan to the fullest extent possible. The various stakeholders in our district have developed sound reopening plans that do comply with CDC guidelines, including solutions to the ventilation issue at the high school, per the email that was sent out from Mr. Shedd yesterday afternoon. If tonight the school board's majority decides to disregard the governor's green designation or finds we can't comply with CDC guidelines for a hybrid model, it will result in a 100% remote model. Should this be the case, I ask you to list specific metrics you're looking at in order to move from 100% remote to a hybrid plan to fully comply with the governor's green designation. If you can't be specific with metrics in this case, I believe you will be basing your vote on hypotheticals and what ifs, not current science or data. We've been told throughout this pandemic to follow the science. Scientific theories are backed up with numbers and data. There will always be studies performed to contradict a given theory, but I ask you tonight, what numbers and data are you using to make your decision? Even our own district physician just spoke to endorse a hybrid model based on sound science in her field. I reiterate, we're a public school under the umbrella of the government, not a private one. We should be following the state of Maine guidelines set forth by Governor Mills and Dr. Shaw. Again, I thank you for the school board's deep consideration on this subject, and I wish you the best as you navigate the many viewpoints before you tonight. Thank you, Emily. Are there other comments from the public? I see Cindy Voltz, if you would like to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I, first of all, would like to second what Emily just said. I do um, appreciate the board's uh, following of, of CDC and state guidelines. And I know you're all um, working to do your best to make the decision within the parameters we've been given. My comments are more um, to address kind of the learning delivery and curriculum plan for the hybrid model. So I am uh, the parent of a ninth grader who will be entering uh, Cape Elizabeth High School this year. And I also have a 19 year old who's a 2019 um, CEHS graduate. Um, I really appreciate all the work that the school teams, the administrators, uh, the board, uh, all the time and effort you've put into preparing for the school year. Um, and your, the dedication you have to our community and our families is, is obvious and appreciated. 
Um, I, I appreciate the letter, the 10 page letter, Mr. Shedd provided to the parent community yesterday. I thought he did a very nice job describing the plans for safety and the logistics of the proposed fall schedule. I do feel though, like we're missing important details around about remote teaching and the delivery of course content. It appears likely that we'll begin the school year under a hybrid model. So that means that most, that all students will spend the majority of their school time in remote learning. Remote learning is not uncharted territory. There are many established platforms and best practices for delivering online instruction. But watching a live stream through Zoom from a classroom is generally not one of those best practices. Um, and in spite of this, I feel like the plan for course delivery has focused on a classroom model. Students that are not in class will Zoom into the classroom. Teachers will be responsible for both in-person learners and remote learners concurrently. And given that remote learners will include both off-day hybrid learners and fully remote learners, the majority of the class every day will attend via Zoom. And in some cases, a remote teacher will be Zooming in to an in-person class. The advantage of in-school learning is to gain personal interaction with instructors. If the instructors in the classroom are teaching more students remotely than are present in class, what impact does that have on the in-person learners? If we have an opportunity for some students to attend in-person classes, we should prioritize those who will benefit most from the in-person instruction and then ensure they're able to realize that benefit in a classroom that allows the teacher to attend to the students who are present. Remote learners require a different type of engagement and many require additional organizational support. Having teachers dedicated to supporting remote learners throughout their day is critical. This appears to be addressed, addressed in the plans presented by the middle school in Panko. I think it'll be difficult for both teachers and students to succeed in a model where the school day entails over five hours on Zoom. If you're not sure what that feels like, just think back to last Tuesday's school board meeting. Again, thank you for all your time and effort that you've put into planning for this unprecedented situation. I know there aren't a lot of easy decisions here and I appreciate uh, what all of you have done to work on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, Nicole Boucher, your hand is raised. You can unmute. Hi everyone, this is Nicole Boucher and I'm at um, 14 Grover Road. Um, I'm actually going to take a different approach and not even speak about the remote or hybrid learning. I trust you guys to make a, a decision knowing how hard this has been and thank you for all of your work. Um, I actually want to talk about the civil rights stuff that's happened in the last few months and a lot of students who have, you know, spoken about events that they have felt in the school system um, just through their years and being students here. And I want to make sure that that conversation isn't lost in everything that we're doing here about COVID and reopening and um, making sure that we have resources, whether they're remote or in person for those students. So I just want to make sure that's still a point of discussion and something that's being worked on and, um, you know, added into the fold with this, whether we do hybrid or remote. So thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And my apologies for pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, and um, just a reminder as well that uh, comments, we like to have them by policy. We don't like by policy, they need to be directly related to the conversation. And um, I do believe that was related, though loosely, it was definitely intertwined with the conversation. So just a reminder to all. John, I see John Volz's hand up. My phone working? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. First of all, again, thank you to everybody. Um, this is not an uh, easy situation for anybody. Uh, um, I appreciate all the hard work. I have a few couple of points and I'm mostly trying to keep them uh, uh, helpful and forward looking. Um, a couple of things is everyone wants our kids back in school like it was pre-pandemic. But that's not really possible. Even if you're going to be in school, it will not be like what it was pre-pandemic. Part of it will be remote. In fact, the majority of it will be remote. And so really we're talking about how do we bridge the gap until we have effective national mitigation, vaccines, or uh, you know, and even effective testing so that you can effectively combat the pandemic in a way that we currently can't. 
So with that said, uh, we've got a lot of different ap approaches. I think all of them have merit. Um, I want to uh, let folks know it's very likely that we're not going to succeed at parts of this and that's going to happen and we under i want to know you i understand that but what i want to let you know is i i stand ready and i hope other community members stand ready to help you continue to get it right and more right and more right as we go because none of us have done this before and then the last thing i want to just talk about briefly is is the, um again we really want to focus on, I think, on how do we build the structure for kids because they're going to be remote and how do we build engagement with the kids that are going to be remote and how do we stay safe? Um, the thing that concerns me about Maine has great numbers. I, I understand that and that gives us a lot of opportunity. Um, some of those numbers do lag a bit in some of the reporting and the numbers can change relatively quickly as we've seen recently. And so when you've got an infection period that's six days, and your, and your lag of the data is some significant portion of that infectious period, it does cause me a, a bit of concern. We're not yet at the point where we have rapid on point, you know, point of uh, use testing. That may be coming hopefully soon. There's, there's movement in that direction, but we don't have it yet. And so that makes it much harder to put uh, kids in a situation where you have a number of risk factors, which is many people in the same, same place, indoors for a long time. Um, that doesn't mean you can't do things to mitigate it, we're doing that, but that, that's the nature of the situation. So I stand ready to think about how you can engage parents, how we can help you at the things that are not going as well as we go out and think about putting together a frame, framework where you can call on uh, and get help from people in the community with the things that you are uh, find challenging as we head into this most unusual semester. Thank you. Thank you for that, John. Are there any other comments? Uh, let's see, Elizabeth here. You have three minutes, I can unmute. Hi, my name is Liz. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Liz Yarrington. I'm an English teacher. Yes. Well, um, I'm also a building representative for the Cape Elizabeth Education Association. Um, and I'll make my comments now as a representative of the association. Uh, I'd like to thank Superintendent Wolfram, members of the board, and all the administrators for their incredibly hard work this summer. Um, I'd just like to make a few points. First, I'd like to reiterate the concern that many members have for their physical safety if they are to teach in the buildings. Uh, the news about the ventilation that we heard last week certainly made that concern even stronger for many. Uh, when I revisited the Colby Company assessment of the district's ventilation from October of last year, I read in several places that uh, many pieces of ventilation equipment throughout the buildings were, quote, nearing or beyond their useful life expectancy and should be scheduled for replacement in the near future. Uh, if members are to be confident of their safety, I think the membership and all staff need to be assured that these issues have been addressed. Additionally, it has come to the association's attention that some members who have asked to work remotely have still not heard at this time if those requests will be honored. Um, and this is days before um, we're supposed to start in person. Um, additionally, um, in addition to a concern for safety, many members have um, very real concerns about childcare for their own children, should they re be required to return to, to buildings, um, particularly if students are learning remotely, 100% remotely, staff members should be able to work remotely as well. Um, the association has not been provided with a reason for staff members needing to be in the building if students are not in the building. So um, the association asks that um, that policy be revisited. Uh, finally, I'd like to address the idea that school staff are essential workers. Um, I think that, you know, we all love teaching. We all love being with students. And I think teachers, all teachers and staff would agree that 
educating students is essential. Um, but teaching, as we have seen, can happen remotely. And while I'm not suggesting that that, that is necessarily the, the right choice, um, and I'm not suggesting that remote learning is ideal, uh, I think the safety and students of students and staff must be our number one priority. Um, so if staff attendance in the building is required in a hybrid model, this, the association asks that um, the board keep that as its top priority and communicate to staff and to community families what it's done, what it's doing to ensure that that, is, uh, that remains a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the public? I see Gina Tapp. You may unmute yourself. Gina? Hi, Gina. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just want to comment both as a parent of a high school student and also in my role, I'm the HR director for the city of Portland. And I just want to put in this whole conversation um, the idea of perspective and that the perspective we have on this is it's something we must get through now. It's not the way it's going to be forever. So the emphasis on trying to make it perfect now, we can't make it perfect now. There's so much unknown. We're all doing the best we can. And I hear that in everyone's comments that we want to do the best we can now for our students. So I just want to add that um, perspective to this conversation that whatever we're doing now, hopefully will get us through this bridge to where we can get back to normal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, it's not a full name, it's C. McAnuff. 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 My apologies. No worries. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my name is Christina McAnuff. I live at 65 Stony Brook Road, and I am the stepmother of a rising junior and the mother of a rising fifth grader. And my comments are very brief. I want to thank you all for the work you're doing and to say that after Maslow's hierarchy of needs are met, which is, of course includes safety, um, that what our children need most are stability and consistency. And so after all of the safety concerns, which I will entrust to you all, please consider um, when you're um, looking at the different options for hybrid models, which it appears uh, most likely, to consider stability and consistency so that children, particularly those who have special education needs aren't, aren't, consistency is not, you know, a Monday, Tuesday, and then another Thursday, Friday, um, the following week. Something where it's perhaps a morning or an afternoon for four or five days a week that allows our children to get the support they need. Um, remote learning, I know, is, um, is an option and it's worked well for some students. It hasn't worked well for all. And I'm the parent of one of those children who really struggles with remote learning. And so I am concerned that her skills gap is going to increase um, more than it, it, it already has. And so I ask you respectfully to keep those two words in mind, stability and consistency, when you're considering the different options. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and we are nearing the end of our public comment period, but there is one more person I'm going to call on, Kara. If you would like to start speaking, you have three minutes. This will be our last comment. Thank you so much for inviting me to have comments. Um, I want to express my gratitude for the school board. Um, I do not envy any of you, and you are all just, uh, you know, my heart goes out to all of you as you make this decision. Um, our school is where this epidemic began in the state of Maine, um, in my child's classroom. Um, COVID is transmitted through respiratory droplets. The droplets move through the air. Our school is underfunded. Our schools are not properly ventilated. We do not have proper filtration systems. We have a 50-year-old 
ventilation system in the high school. Surface transmission, according to scientists, is not the problem. We have to increase the circulation of the outdoor air. There are, there's no ventilation in the high school hallways. I think everyone needs to realize that being 50 feet apart with a low dose of virus in the air over a sustained period of time is enough to cause infection and death. And I think that the teachers did not sign up to risk their lives to teach our children. They did not sign up to risk their children's lives to teach our children. They are not police officers. They are not firefighters. They are not members of the military. This is not what they signed up for. And um, that, is, I, that is what I have to say in the public record. And I thank you for the opportunity to be part of this community and to be able to live in a democracy where we can organize ourselves this way and um, communicate with one another this way. And I appreciate all of you very much. Thank you for those comments. Moving on, we have administrative reports and we're gonna start with Superintendent Wolfram. So good evening and again, thank you for attending our meeting tonight. I wanted to do a quick review of where we are as we have been working through plans this summer. The district administrative team has been meeting usually twice a week all summer to develop a framework for the return of school, which was presented to the school board on July 28th, 2020. This framework included two green designations, one of which would mean that we could have everyone return to school as usual without restrictions, or a green in which everyone could return to school following Maine CDC and the Maine DOE recommendations, requirements, and guidelines. The yellow plan within the framework is a hybrid model in which half the students attend on designated maroon days and half the students attend on designated gold days, complying with the recommendations and requirements. The final plan within the framework is the red plan in which everyone is assigned to the 100% remote learning plan. On July 31st, Governor Mills designated all counties in Maine as green, which means that 100% of the students can return to school. However, guidelines and requirements must be followed. Unfortunately, our classrooms are not large enough to ensure the three feet social distancing guidelines for classes of 15 to 20 students, nor do we have facilities for the six feet social distancing requirements for eating for all of our students at work. We don't have the space to divide all classes in half and have everyone in our buildings, nor do we have the resources to hire certified teachers to teach those classes. Given the limitation, the district administrators reviewed many types of schedules and structures and the details that accompanied all of those schedules and structures. We examined the feasibility of sanitizing and disinfecting from each, transportation with social distancing requirements, entrances to buildings, traffic in hallways, medical health and safety needs, and the list goes on. We discussed the morning afternoon possibility with half the students attending in each session. However, we determined that it was impossible to thoroughly sanitize the classrooms and the school in the one hour between sessions. We studied the maroon on Mondays and Tuesdays and gold on Wednesdays and Thursdays, but realized that a maroon gold, maroon gold schedule was a better educational model with direct instruction followed by practice rather than two instructional days in a row. We developed a green, yellow, and red framework that was then presented to the district planning team for feedback. This team consisted of teachers, parents, administrators, district nurses, a school psychologist, and school board members. The framework was revised according to their comments and then presented to the school board. On July 28, 2020, the plan was adopted by the school board. We then heard from many teachers who requested that the support professional development day be changed from Friday to Wednesday in order to support them with childcare and to provide midweek planning time. We are proposing to make that change um, to meet their needs. Then on August 11th, the board met to discuss and adopt the plan and the framework for returning to school. After a lengthy discussion, the board determined that more information was needing, needed and this meeting was scheduled. The decision is 
one for the board, and we know we cannot fully please everyone and meet everyone's needs. However, the hybrid plan offers parents a choice, 100% remote learning or two days a week in school with remote support and instruction on the at-home days. This week, more district administrative meetings occurred along with conversations, meetings, and tours with HVAC experts, a conversation with an epidemiologist, and communication with our district physicians. The board requested presentations by an HVAC expert and by an epidemiologist. However, these experts are being advised by the organizations to be cautious in the recommendations to schools due to the legal implications of their statements. For example, this is an email we received, we received from an HVAC expert. Mechanical services is having our lawyers follow up on what we should and should not be saying in regard to buildings and COVID-19. We certainly can't say a building is completely safe. However, we can stick to the facts and say that doing something will improve ventilation in the hallways. There is not enough information at this point to say how much it will improve or whether it is enough, even if we are of the opinion that it is, which is what everyone is going to want to know. What we have been doing is providing assistance and information to facilities managers, and they have been relaying that information to the superintendent and the school board. Tonight we heard from our, our district physicians, Mita Sante. Her message to me earlier this week stated, in my brief review of the state epidemiological data, our local schools and the current low transmission in the community, it is my feeling that schools in this community can safely reopen with all the hard work and infection control that is and will be in place. As far as ventilation concerns, I think getting an expert's a very good idea, but even old, in old buildings, the risk is mitigated by diligent screening of students and staff and infection control, such as masks and hand washing. Perry will be speaking on the condition of ventilation at Pong Cove in the middle school and on our successful efforts to improve ventilation in the hallways of the high school and the nurses room at the high school this week. Our buildings are old and we know that they have limitations due to their age. We will soon be resuming our meetings with the building continue building committee and will continue our discussions about how to deal with these limitations. For now, our efforts are aimed at making our buildings safe so that our students and staff can return. Noel will be discussing efforts to improve connectivity outside our buildings in order to provide outdoor classroom settings for teachers and students. Principals and assistant principals have been and will be surveying their grounds for outdoor settings and schedules will be developed for classroom use of those settings as long as weather conditions permit. At least one large tent has been purchased for the high school. Masks will still be required and three feet social distancing requirements will be followed outside. Principals and assistant principals along with school nurses have been walking hallways within our buildings to develop traffic patterns to identify procedures for using bathrooms and hallways and to develop opportunities for mask breaks and increased hand washing. Those details will be shared with parents to review with their students before the start of school. Signage and PPEs are arriving in district, good news. We are using the high school cafeteria for a storage area and PPEs will be distributed to each school for use during the first month of school. Storage for the remainder of the PPEs will be at the high school and additional, additional requests will be filled from the high school at the request of each school. Signage will be displayed throughout schools in the next week. We've had many comments about fall sports. In Maine, the Maine Principals Association, MPA, is the governing body of sports, although each district can opt to participate or not in any sport. The MPA sets requirements and rules for sports and oversees plans for scheduling of events. Currently, we are awaiting the ruling of the MPA regarding all sports. A large factor in the decision about whether or not to sanction fall sports is the matter of social distancing requirements. In the latest guidelines from the Maine CDC regarding PK, pre-K through 12 and adult education public health guidance, which are provided in our supporting documents for tonight. Outdoor requirements of 14 feet for social distancing without masks and six feet of social distancing outdoors and indoors 
uh, with masks is required. Please understand that CDC guidance for rec programs outside of education are different. All of the community service programs and private club teams follow the main CDC community sports guidelines. Maine Middle School and High School are required to follow the Maine Department of Ed guidelines, two separate guidelines. Communication from the MPA regarding fall, fall sports will be shared as we receive it. District discussions will continue around our fall sports offerings and our ability to meet CDC education guidelines should we move forward with the fall sports season. We know that all of you are eager for information regarding the start of school as district administrators are eager for clear direction regarding the plan in which we will start. In addition, we realize that teachers are eager, eager to plan for the start of the year as they start back to work on Monday. We are in the process of com compiling remote learning enrollment requests and principals will be able to finalize their class lists and publish those lists based on that information. In addition, busing schedules will be developed based on those students who will attend in school learning and those schedules will be released. We're in the process of the completion of a parent student handbook, which will outline practices and procedures, and we will distribute that when we can add the details based on tonight's decision. We will distribute information through the avenues that we have used to date, our website, our Facebook page, and our PowerSchool email blasts. If you, uh, if those of you at home and with us tonight, if find you're not receiving that information, please contact your school to make sure that they have your updated contact information. We have heard from many staff and realize that this is a stressful time for them. Childcare is a huge issue for our young teaching staff, and we have worked to change our support day from Friday to Wednesday, as well as to incorporating midweek planning time in order to better meet their needs. We're also working with community services to try to provide opportunities for childcare coverage for children of our staff. In addition, we have worked to create opportunities for those staff who have high risk medical needs to teach remotely. We will continue to work with staff in order to meet their needs and make their back to school experience less stressful. We realize that plans made now may need to change as we progress through this challenging year and we will make every effort to be flexible and to meet the needs of our students and our families. We're counting on families to screen their students each day and to keep them home should they display symptoms in order to protect our entire community. We're committed to providing a learning environment that is as safe as possible in this challenging pandemic and need the entire community, learning community, home and school to work together in this effort. We realize that as we reopen our school, there may be bumps along the way, plans that need to be revised, traffic patterns in our hallways that may need to be changed, lunch and re recess plans that may need to be reworked, and we are committed to being flexible and changing to make things work as smoothly as possible. We have listened to staff and to the community and have tried to meet their needs. We ask for your continued support and patience and we work to provide an excellent, as we work to provide an excellent education for our students during these difficult and challenging times. Thank you. Um, do boys have any comments or questions? I'm not seeing any. I appreciate that update, Don. The principals, why don't we start with Paul Cove and Jason? Oh, I'm sorry, it didn't show up. Elizabeth, thank you, Elizabeth. Go ahead. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Donna because I realized that this board and this board member in particular and the entire community have asked a lot of questions and have asked a lot of you Donna, and I really appreciate the information that you've been sharing over these last several meetings and in particular tonight. And um, I'd like to just recognize what a great job you're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Are there any other comments? Okay. 
Okay. Moving on to Pond Cove and Jason Mangerini is our principal there. You have the floor. Thank you, Heather. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, so I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity to share tonight and thank um, all the community members have, who have come out. Um, it's great to see such high numbers at these meetings. Um, I'd like to start by um, just asking the board. So I have shared, I believe, I hope, Heather, that you received um, a couple documents from me earlier today. Um, yeah. And I, so I have an outline of just basically a summary of um, full remote and hybrid model. And I also have a summary of health and safety measures. Would you like for me to address both of those? Um, yeah, I'll do that. The, the, the program summaries I did address last time, but I yeah. could go over them again. I don't think we need to review what was spoken about last time. So I, I think if you can add on any new information would be appreciative, unless board members um, feel differently. Um, speak up if you do, but I, I would say not to repeat what we've heard. I think we all listened carefully and took it in and reviewed the documents again that were sent out. And so just adding on what you, new information would be appreciated. Sure. Thank so. Um, I think that what I, I'll start with talking about the health, the summary of health and safety measures that we've been talking about. And I'm wondering if, um, if you would like to make me a co-host or if Jen is sharing the conversation. I've made everyone who is speaking tonight a co-host already. So you're Thanks. all Yep. Thank you, Jen. Okay. No problem. Great. Okay. Um, you're able to see that, Heather? Yes. Okay. So um, what I've done here is um, I've received lots of questions, lots of great questions from um, staff and from uh, Pond Cove families about uh, some of the health and safety measures that we plan to take um, if we are to reopen um, if we are re reopened for live teaching, particularly in a hybrid model. Uh, so what I've done is from our plans, I've kind of pulled some highlights and created a summary here to share tonight. And these, these will all be part of a comprehensive handbook, which, you know, as we get closer to school reopening um, and the, the handbook is finalized, we'll go out to staff and to families. Uh, so what I have here, um, some examples, I've had lots of questions about um, social distancing and PPE at Pond Cove. Um, just as we are, I mean, this will be our first go at um, having very, very young children um, in school um, at a time like this and, and, and teaching them how to use the PPE. But this is what we have in our plans at this time. Um, and as Donna mentioned, this is going to be a, a continuous like review, revisit and refine um, consistently, just like everything that we do. Uh, so social distancing and PPE, as far as our plans, and then examples of in the classroom and common areas throughout the building. So we have already started identifying um, furniture that can stay in rooms and furniture that needs to leave rooms um, in order to um, achieve the social distancing space that we need. Um, so Teachers are, are beginning the process of, of um, identifying things that will leave their room and stay. And uh, we're working with Perry um, to identify places to store some of the furniture that needs to come out for now. So there'll only be select furniture in the rooms. Of course, um, students will have assigned seating. They'll have their own spaces and they won't, will not share spaces where they settle down and sit and have their work materials. Um, we're identifying alternative spaces for breakout and work sessions. So library, cafeteria, empty classrooms, which will be, we'll have some empty classrooms because we'll have some, some um, students going fully remote, which will actually free up some space. And then also outdoor spaces. We're gonna be looking carefully at those. Um, Pond Cove at this time is planning to use lockers 
but they're going to be accessed under supervised social distancing guidelines. We're really using them. It, it won't look at all like a typical day at Pond Cove. We'll be using them for storage, but students will come to school, go to their rooms, unpack for the day, and then be guided through a process where they'll go into the halls, uh, supervised and store their belongings. Um, lunch and lunch and breakfast delivered and served in classrooms and students will be distant six feet while eating. Um, I wanted to share something really quickly with you. This is something that um, this is an example of a classroom with with six foot social distancing and I wanted just people to just to get a sense of this. This is something that actually Nurse Taylor and I did maybe a, a month and a half or two months ago. Um, let's see. Uh, let me go to that tab. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm hoping you can see this. Um, so here's an example. You can see the rooms are pretty stripped out, right? So though that is, those are six foot spaced desks. So it looks quite different than a typical classroom. Um, and so a lot of furniture does have to come out. Just wanted people to get that visual. Okay, let me go back. Okay, so we're also going to be using something we're calling stable cohorts or potting. So as few students as possible, mingling with as few other students as possible throughout the day, staying with that group throughout the day in the classroom, eating lunch in the classroom with that group, going to sections of the playground with that group to reduce the risk of transmission. Um, Mandatory face covering shields, face shields worn by staff and students, of course. Um, um, adults traveling rather than students traveling throughout the building when possible. A little bit easier to do in elementary school than, um, than high school and middle, I would presume. Um, for example, uh, allied teachers traveling to classrooms. Specialists traveling to wings rather than students going throughout the building reducing hallway common area traffic and determining max capacities for places like restrooms and coming up with plans and really working with students and monitoring that so that it's safe. Um, so, so physical distancing during recess, playground divided into zones, staff supervising each area, um, students remaining in their stable cohorts within a zone on the playground. Um, so again, looks very much different than typical school, but we're gonna do everything we can to make it fun and enjoyable for the kids. Um, recess, still mandatory face covering, shields worn by staff, um, hand washing before and after recess, and designated areas for supervised distance mask breaks. Um, of course, we're gonna be looking for opportunities to do that for kids throughout the day. Recess is a great opportunity where we're outside and we can really social distance, and provide a structure for kids to take a break. Arrival and dismissal. We, I, this is just, I'm just going over some highlights so you can get a sense of all the details we're thinking of. Students are entering buildings um, closest to their wing when possible. We'll be working with um, police department and with transportation and think, seeing if there are different places students can be dropped off so that they come in different areas of the building. Um, face coverings and shields required during arrival and dismissal. Um, the possibility of a staggered start, depending on the number of parents who um, transport their students. And footpaths and walkways within pro close proximity to school designated for student travel. So reducing, we have such a wonderful community of parents and Pond Cove is typically such an amazing place in the morning and afternoon, groups of adults and children standing around and talking. And we're gonna be kind of, um, kind of asking people to um, to come up with some different routines for a while while we get through this and then down here i just have you know education and training for staff and students hand hand hygiene taught retaught reviewed continuously we're going to really emphasize this um, purpose and benefits of mask wearing and uh, face coverings and shields, um, social distancing training for staff and students, and training on how to travel through the building and on campus. So really trying to pay attention to every detail um, and, um, and know that we're going to need to teach and reteach these things explicitly. That, that's the end of this brief summary. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has questions for me or if you'd like for me to, to address anything else. And 
board members because he has shared his screen. Oh, Hope Straw, it does show up. Hope, go ahead. Hi. Um, so, uh, J Jason, thank you very much for this. This is uh, wonderful to have this level of detail. And I noticed you said six foot spacing. Are we, so I know the framework was um, sort of the requirements for returning to school were modified over the summer to go from six feet to three feet. Are we, are you saying we're able to achieve six feet throughout Pond Cove? It's that that was an example of a classroom with six feet. Some of the classrooms are pretty tight and it, it depends on how many students are remote and what the actual class sizes on campus are. But we we believe that we can pretty much in every room um, achieve that six feet. Once classes get to 10, 11, there may be some that are between three and six. Got it. Thank you. Phil. Thank you. I, uh, thank you, uh, Jason. This is very helpful and very detailed. Just a quick question about, and I know we've asked this a couple different times, a couple different ways, I guess, over the last few weeks, but outdoor learning. It's a question we continue to get from, you know, residents and parents. Um, and we did hear from Mr. Shedd that there's at least a, uh, a tent or two coming for the high school. Is there anything that you're thinking about for the elementary school and outdoor classrooms? Right. So, so outdoor learning is something that we value and, and should do more of any time, even, even outside of the pandemic. It's something we're definitely talking about. We don't have um, arrangements at this time for tents or anything like that. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure is that the plans we have are sustainable and that we can um, deliver what we say we, we want to deliver, regardless if it's raining or if it's cold or if it's, so we're going to be strongly encouraging outdoor learning for sure, more than ever, um, and, um, and breaks being outside. Um, there are a lot of challenges around outdoor learning, including our climate. Um, so uh, I can't say this time that there'll be like a certain percentage of learning would be outdoors. Uh, I know we have a lot of teachers, <laughs> that have, have expressed in a lot of interest in being outdoors, um, but I just wanna make sure that I'm being really straightforward with parents that, um, you know, if it's, if the weather's, if the weather's not fair, you know, we'll be inside all day. And, um, but certainly, yes, I mean, we have a lot of great spaces. Our new playground is an amazing um, spot for, for outdoor learning. I actually, um, yesterday discovered I, i'm very interested if someone would come forward somebody someone has placed these wonderful benches and created this amazing outdoor learning classroom by our gazebo and i i admit that i am not sure who did that and i want to thank them um thanks phil thank you very much that was very helpful kimberly Hello, Jason. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. That was a um, super informative and detailed. Um, and as reference, we have had a lot of interest from the community in exploring outdoor classrooms. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, we have a lot of creative, um, capable people in the community. I don't know if this could be an opportunity to collaborate, um, you know, with community members um, on how to create and, um, you know, how, how best to utilize space for outdoor learning. Thank you so much, Kimberly. And, and yes, for sure, we do. And we, I've had people reach out and um, I'm in the process of scheduling a meeting with Lindsay Barrett. So uh, we talked yesterday and, and um, we haven't landed on a date yet to meet, but she sounds like she has a lot of great ideas and is interested in working with us. Um, so that meeting will be happening soon. Um, so thank you, Kimberly. Yes, for sure. Okay, I'm not seeing other questions. Um, Jason, thank you so much for that update. I'm very appreciated to hear some of those 
uh, safety measures that you guys have worked on all those details. I know people have been curious to hear how that's all going to play out. And um, that visual was very effective. So thank you of the classroom with the six feet distancing. Moving on to our middle school presentation from the principal, Troy Eastman. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'm going to ask Kathy to help. She's going to share a screen with you in a minute because I'm always rid of all the screen sharing stuff. Um, so I've done my homework and I have somebody help. But uh, I just want to quickly start out by saying, much like Jason, our, I mean, we have, we're working as Donna said on a staff and a student handbook and all the safety protocols and procedures are in there. Um, and they sound practically identical as they should for the district. Um, to Jason's protocols um, that he has mentioned. So there'll be a lot more information on that. We are in the process of starting, we're gonna to try to set a bus up in the classrooms and the hallways and the signage and all of that stuff and have a video that we're gonna send out. And a lot of this is gonna be the slow rolling that we're proposing kind of for students to get that exposure. So that's where we would be instructing the students on some of that stuff. Um, and I, I think that would be a really I think that'll be a really helpful time for our kids. It's, it's really important. So um, if Kathy's ready to share the screen. I sure can. That would be awesome. Teamwork. So oh, that's the last slide. We're going to let the cat no, out I'm of the gonna, right Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on, hang on. Okay. So at the last meeting, I shared with you um, our basic schedule and plan for the hybrid um, model. And what I wanted to do today was kind of quickly take you through the process that we went through to, to arrive at that. I, when I left that meeting, it, it felt like, huh, people could think we just made this up out of thin air. So I wanted to kind of share where this came from and the process that we went through to do it. And when, I don't know who coined the phrase, the gold standard, but I love it. And you know that kind of keeps in mind that we're always striving to be our best. So Throughout this, you're gonna see the little circle up in the right-hand corner that says, you know, TGS, and that really stands for the gold standard because we want that to drive our decisions is always thinking of the, so that's really the opening slide. And if we can just move on, Kathy will put us through this. So the next slide really talks about an overview of this slide presentation. I sent it to the school board ahead of time. Um, and it talks about all, all of the areas that we took into account and consideration as we made this decision. So um, if you could move it, Kathy, that'd be great. So really we wanted to talk about how did we get to our plan? And there was a lot of time and thought that went into that. We, we reviewed the parent surveys from the spring, the, we had teacher feedback from our spring of emergency remote learning and student surveys. and we. We went through all of those and took into consideration as we move forward, we need to use that data in, in, in coming to our next plan. Along with that, we took into account the CDC guidelines, the main Department of Education guidelines. And then we got down to the nuts and bolts really of um, what does our community and, and school stand for? And there's nothing better than our, than our recent future search um, process that we've gone through to develop a strategic plan and board goals. Um, we've talked about it with some district committees and building committees. Uh, to come up with some possible choice. So that really led us to, all of that led us to, whenever we design something, we obviously want it to be successful. So we had to come up with, how do you define success? And I think we quickly realized success is defined in multiple ways. Is it from, oops, Kathy got a little bit ahead of me, but I'm gonna go off memory here. Is it rigor? Thank you, Kathy. Is it quality versus quantity? Does the amount of seat time determine if it's a success or not? Or is it the quality of it? Some people would say perfect attendance is, is a measure of success or being kind to others or being honest and respectful. Um, maybe they're gonna say, my, if my child is in accelerated math in fifth grade, that's a success. So there's a variety of successes. Is it the growth versus mindset is really what we're, growth or mindset is really what we're shooting for here. So we had our, a lot of information. We were trying to define success. So we went right to the, the policies and procedures and really the values of the board. So if you could turn it now, Kathy, that would be great. And so we, it took us right to the future search. And that was a combination of over 100 people from the community, parents, teachers, kids, students, um, business leaders in the community, faith leaders in the community. And it was, it was an incredibly powerful experience 
what we all talked about schools and what we value. And the white link there, if you want to read a 19 page executive summary, there it is. And um, I'm just going to highlight the ones that kind of really struck home as we were defining success. One was health and well being. Our schools provide a supportive learning environment, which physical, social, and I can't see that side of the scene, but I think it says emotional well being are valued and promoted. So, really, uh, we're talking about a well rounded experience for our kids. And then, who would have thought global competencies? You know, back then when, we, when this came up, our students will be personally responsible, aware, empathetic, and engaged, and local, and I think it says national um, situations. What a time for that. Our students need to know their responsibility in this process in a pandemic. How can they help their, their neighbor and themselves and their family and their community? And really, we need to teach that. And, and it's perfectly stated there. And then really the other one that was largely important here was the multiple pathways and definitions of success. Our schools will value, promote, and celebrate multiple pathways um, and multiple definitions of success. There was our answer. Well, there is no one answer to what success looks like, right? We don't want it to be one answer. We want it to be a, a variety of answers and we want it to meet different needs for kids. So the next one, whoops, we're going backwards. We're, Okay, so that was helpful for us in looking at what the board has given us. And then if you can move on, the next one was, we wanted to go a little further and it was the vision, mission and values that our school board has. And it moved really quickly on me again, but I- Oh, I'm sorry, Troy, yeah. I, okay, go, go ahead. Um, the vision, the mission, and really where we got down to the values was the important part for us is making for developing our plan. And in the academics, again, we found we value. So we being the Cape Elizabeth School Board, school department, school town. We value rich and varied learning experiences that support critical thinking, perseverance, effective communication and independence and collaborative work inside and outside of the classroom. I found that to be so interesting that that was listed there. Um, and we honor multiple pathways and alternative definitions of success. That is, in a nutshell is what we're experiencing right now is all of that really, that sentence is loaded with a lot of powerful stuff, but it goes to what we value in Kate. And we value a variety of experiences. Not one, there's not one method or one model, but a variety of them. And we really want kids to learn how to be independent and collaborative and at the same time and work inside and outside of our room. So I found it really helpful. And then the next part of, of our values was passion. And it says, we value personal investment in learning in an environment that nourishes joy and creativity, protects risk taking and individual expression, values individual expression. There again, that means we need a variety of offerings for our kids. And because it may be band that makes that a kid or a student finds their personal investment. It may be math class. It may be art class. And we need to value all those things equally through this process. We can't just become short sighted or narrow focused. So that was some guiding supports. Kathy. Oh, wrong way. Sorry. No, hang on. It's um it's struggling to keep up with us. Yeah, there's a, a little bit of a lag, but there you go. So this slide looks chaotic purposefully because this is kind of what, go, what was going through all of our minds. Um, it's kind of overwhelming and it causes anxiety when I look at this slide, but it's all really important stuff. And I kind of feel sometimes like the donkey that's lined up in the starting gate with a thoroughbred to win the Kentucky Derby. It's like, how am I going to do all this? How is this going to happen? And it does create a certain sense of nervousness in us. And so it clearly in the middle is the pandemic. You know, that's a challenge to meeting the gold standard right now is the pandemic. And then to go around that, we have challenges with technology and staff needs and student needs. So we had to take all those into consideration. Um, in the background of this slide shows a bunch of mountains and, and it does seem like every time we clear a mountain, there's another one behind us, another one in front of us coming towards us and something has changed. So now there's another challenge. So we are working really hard at that. We have a lot of committees working at it. And many of these things have been solved since, you know, the creation of this slide. But these are all the problems or the, the challenges, really, that got in the way of meeting the gold standard in a hybrid or remote situation. So we needed to find some balance after that chaotic slide. So where's the balance? What are the things we need to have balance in our hybrid or our remote learning model? And really it's the whole child versus limited experiences. It's mental health with physical health. It's screen time versus non-screen time. Um, win advisory where we offer a lot of supports versus additional content time. Isolation versus connectedness. 
You know, are you going to perform? Do you want to be in a, class, a Zoom with 25 students or a Zoom with 12? Academic versus social emotional um, or with social emotional. Then we have all these other with GT, special education, English language learners, core content, allied arts, all of these wonderful things that we, we need to include and be thoughtful of. We really needed to try to find a strike a balance between school and life itself. And then a balance between being rigid yet flexible in our expectations. So the, this, is, this was helping guide us as we went through the process. And then starting two years ago, social emotional well-being pre-pandemic was one of the biggest concerns in Cape Elizabeth schools that I would be able to identify. Um, and I think that we would be very short-sighted to think that with a pandemic, that need has gone down in any way. So that needs to remain on the forefront. Um, we need to do community building. We need to have, be aware of social emotional well-being of our families, our staff, and our students. And in a way that we've done that with our, with our plan is the creation of an advisory program, targeted counseling, SEL lessons. Um, we're fortunate to have a mindfulness coach this year for three days a week through a grant that's funded free of charge um, in, a guide, in a robust guidance curriculum. So those are gonna be important parts of our, of our plan moving forward. And then I think there's this, one, there's this feeling that Cape, we're fortunate, which we are, that we have one community. We're not working with eight or 10 towns or 12 towns like many schools are right now. We're one. However, we are one Cape, but we have many needs and much diversity in Cape, even though we sometimes want to think there's not. For example, just over this summer, we, the food service has provided over 2,000 meals this summer. Just this summer, 2,000 meals. Um, there's a variety of infrastructures in home, the internet, the quiet um, spaces for students to work, parental supports available. You know, some families is one, someone home, some there's not. We need to, we could put in their siblings. So that list could go on and on and on. Some of the different needs that we're trying to meet. The Win Advisory is a place that we've really decided to try to meet that. And that's why it still has a place in our schedule. Um, during that time, we offer things like education, GT intervention, English um, language learners, academic, social, emotional supports. And then because of the many needs, it takes many different programs to find the niche for people. And that's where the Applied Arts programming comes in. Whoops. Sorry, I think the wind blew. And um, sports guidance and executive functioning. Thank you, Kathy. And how do we continue to meet the gold standard? So luckily, we have a very strong and supportive community. And I appreciate that. And, it's, and it helps us every day at school. I'm gonna to transition to a different room. And this is why remote learning can be challenging. Um, we're very lucky that we have supportive organizations like CEF and parent associations. They just kind of keep things going for us and they provide us with that extra support. And then we have to really, in order to meet that gold standard, we have to make sure that we continue with high quality professional development really as, our, as we transition to what I'm calling limitless education. Education will be different after this, regardless, no matter what. Um, we, we're learning a lot. We're gonna have a lot of different skills as a result of this, but it takes a lot of time to, to support it. And then we meet the gold standard by continuing to meet the needs of our families, but by engaging our students, supporting our teachers, really need a supportive and forward thinking school board, a creative and flexible group of staff, thinking wise, and the growth mindset. Um, having high expectations, I can only see some of those, so I'm going to try to remember them. Um, clear continuous. and continuous something. Review of educational plan and oh, yeah. clear communication. There you go. We got it. Thank you. And then, so this is quickly a, a, a different view of the schedule I presented last week um, to try to clear it up and make it a little easier to look at. But one thing that we found, based on all the information I just shared, something that was a very high priority for us was to have equity in the choices that parents were being offered. And it was important to us that, and I've had several phone calls from parents saying, if I choose remote, what am I missing out on? Or if I choose to send my kid to hybrid, are they getting more or less? And that, and I just, I basically said, I can't let you off that hook. We've created an absolutely equitable situation because we want you to be able to make the decision that's best for you and your family regardless without thinking of the implications educationally because everything is equitable so the 100 percent remote student would have the same schedule as the 50 percent in-person student 
The difference is there would be a remote teacher assigned to them um, and potentially maybe some streaming, you know, some synchronous learning, but largely there's going to be a remote teacher assigned to them. Um, and you can see that would be the Monday, Thursday, the Tuesday, Friday, different group of teachers, because I do not think it's that really feasible to have our teachers working in person and then working remotely at the same time and think that they're going to be at their best. So our teachers are going to be staying in the classroom, teaching in person, or they're going to be the remote teachers. And some of those are allied arts and some will be providing content instruction. So there's a sample of what that would look like um, scheduling wise. So the point, the big point here is we used all of the tools to our disposal to find out what do we value in CAPE. And it seems like multiple pathways, multiple definitions of success. We want kids to find their passion. And to do that, we have to offer them everything. We can't just change the rules on them because there's a pandemic. Um, so that's really what we're working from, from a baseline. And I think the next slide is just a, a less busy version of this, which you can have to look at. I could explain it if you have questions in a minute, but it's pretty self-explanatory. And then the last slide essentially kind of brings us back to, you know, that's the Hope Garden at the, at the um, middle school. And I thought it was an interesting quote that Matt Sturgis had. I know things may seem bleak at times, but it's effort, but it is efforts like this that inspire and give us all something to look forward to annually as these tulips will endeavor year after year as a message of hope, said town manager Matthew Sturgis. And then down bottom it says, these gardens were planted in the fall of 2018 and bloomed for the first time last spring in concert with the You, to, you Will Be Found at CMS um, initiative sponsored by the Thompson Family Mental Health Initiative and the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation. This season, with students distance learning amid the COVID-19 emergency, the tulips have bloomed again. I just think that it shows that together we will get through this. There is hope. We will get to the end of it. Um, and those tulips will come up again. So I feel really strong about what we're doing. I feel like we have incredibly um, supportive community, board, staff, and, and we can do this. So that's, I just wanted a little more explanation on how our plan was developed and the thought that went into it. And I really appreciate all the work the board did ahead of time, not knowing that we would need that. Um, it's easy to make, I think, goals. And it's easy to do that when things are great. But we have to make sure we go back and follow those when things are rough. So that was kind of our goal in this process. So thank you. And thank you, Kathy. And are there any questions, I would be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. I think you're muted, Heather. I don't know if you're talking or not, but I couldn't hear you. I too had noise in the background, so I muted it for a little while there. I just wanted to say earlier in the pandemic, I was out for a walk and um, I saw the Hope Garden in bloom. I think I might've even taken a quick picture and mailed it to you and said, this is happening outside of your building. Um, and I just, I appreciate you adding that note to it, um, that hopeful note to all of this. Um, it can seem dark and doomsday like, but I do believe that we can get through it and it's through the work and um, keeping our goals and our visions and um, all of that at the forefront. So thank you for that reminder. Are there any other comments from board members or questions? Okay. Moving on to the high school with Jeff Shedd. Thank you, Heather. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. <clears throat> um, and I will say that uh, I agree with all of the, the values and principles that uh, Troy just presented that are driving his decision making at the middle school. And I know the same values and principles are dri driving um, the decisions at Pond Cove. Um, and they really are driving the decisions and, and models that we're putting forward at the high school as well. There are some differences um, in terms of the um, many varieties and levels of courses that, that kids take at the high school and the expertise and specialization of high school teachers. So our plan looks a little bit different, but the principles are really the same and what we're trying to accomplish are really the same. 
And I, I do want to say at the outset that, and this is sort of echoes a little bit about what, what John Bolt said in the beginning of his comments, none of us has ever done this before. Um, none of our teachers have ever done this. And I'm speaking specifically to hybrid learning, if that's because that's where the bulk of our discussion is going. But none of us has ever done it. Even if we do, if the board decides remote learning, remote learning will look different now than it did in the spring. So if none of us has done whatever would happen in remote learning um, before either, if we do it, if that's the way we go. We will absolutely get some things right <clears throat> and we will absolutely get some things wrong. And the ideas that the high school is proposing, I don't set them forth as the best or perfect ideas. Um, they are well thought out ideas. Um, put together by a team that spent a lot of time that includes a good cross section of teachers and staff at the high school. Um, and it's our best recommendation uh, for where we are right now, but we may need to change it based on how things go. And, and I may be calling on, we will be seeking regular input from teachers and students and staff. Um, those of you who have high school students will, who had high school students in the spring will remember that we got one week into remote learning starting on June, uh, March 16th last year. And at the end of the first week, we were driving everybody completely bonkers. Um, and we changed um, because we realized that we couldn't sustain it. So we will be looking at we, whatever the plan is, uh, however, however we start the year based on the board's decision tonight, whether it's remote or hybrid or whatever, um, we will, it will be a journey and it will be the beginning of a journey and we'll be looking for constant feedback from folks. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm going to be a little bit briefer um, than Pond Cove in the middle school because I, I think I really taxed the time and attention uh, of a lot of people um, yesterday when I sent out a very long sort of documenting question and answer format, trying to answer in one place um, some questions that I've been getting individually from lots of parents and students. Um, and also anticipating some other questions that people might have on their minds, even though um, they may not have addressed it at the time. So, so I am going to be, um, I think, a little bit briefer um, and letting that document speak for itself. I will be highlighting in very bulleted format some of the major highlights around the proposal for this particular form of schedule that we're proposing and also some of the ventilation issues. But I know Perry will be talking about ventilation in a whole lot more depth than I will be. But um, that's sort of what I want to present. And I, I think I did change my settings in Zoom that prevented me from sharing last time. So I'm hopeful that when I press share right now that it will work. Um, so here we go. Does everybody see that screen? Okay, yeah. Don, Don is nodding your head, I'm thinking that is a good sign. Okay, yeah. um, so I can learn and I apologize for being a little uh, scratchy last time. But the hybrid return to school model for CEHS, again, this is not intended to be nearly as comprehensive as what Troy or Jason uh, shared. Um, it is really just highlights of some of the things that I shared in a much longer document yesterday. So in terms of the schedule, um, so I'll preface this by saying, um, you know, reasonable minds can, and I'm sure will differ about particular schedule models. Um, the committee that we, that we had that looked at this, the issue of schedule, it was really the, the thing that we talked about at every single one of our meetings beginning in mid-June, actually. Um, the thing that we all agreed on is that ultimately our schedule determination should be driven as the number one by the number one top priority of health and safety. Um, even within the committee, I will not represent to the group that the, the particular um, variation that I'm putting forward here was, was, was the top decision choice of everybody. It was the strong consensus of the committee that included the nurse, um, teachers, a variety of teachers and a variety of departments. Um, and so that's what I'm putting before the board today, as I did last week. So the proposed model, um, the, the major driving factor that leads us to this proposal is health and safety. Um, and what we really are trying to do is drive down the number of students who pass through any particular classroom in the school over an extended period of time. 
uh, by doing that, we minimize contacts. We try to our best to min mitigate risks. Um, and so the particular model that we put forward means that in any given week, 40 to 50 students roughly um, will pass through every classroom per week rather than 80 to 100, which is what would happen if we had a daily alternating period schedule, which was the place that we started out um, as a committee when we began talking about what the best model would be. We believe um, that because this model allows for greater focus over an extended period of time for fewer subjects, we believe that it's better suited for students who will struggle with remote learning, um, including students with disabilities. Um, and that's a notion that's pretty strongly endorsed by our special educators who have given a lot of thought to this model as well. We think it's more conducive to relationship building because essentially teachers are seen physically in their classes for those who are, who, who are choosing to participate in a hybrid model, if that's the way we go, um, will be seen twice per week in the classroom rather than simply once, is, which is what would happen if we had an alternating period schedule. And we think relationship building is really critical as we go into either remote or hybrid learning um, at the very beginning of the year, which was very different, which will be a very different experience than what we did last year when we jumped to emergency remote learning. There is a disadvantage, <clears throat> and I, I freely acknowledge it, and we've talked about it and debated it um, and come to some judgments about it. There's a disadvantage in that there is a learning gap between terms. There is no question about that. And I address that in a little bit more depth in, well, in a lot more depth in the document that I shared. I think with time, we can, as teachers and students, perhaps gain a real comfort level with whatever we're trying to do, that we can modify this. Um, and we can find ways to sort of bridge that gap, um, even staying within the overall sense of the schedule that we're proposing. Um, so that is definitely a possibility. Um, and I will also say that if the board decides, uh, based on all the information you have, that you do not want us to do this particular schedule, we can move to a different model. Uh, we do think this is the best suited, uh, balancing all the needs that we have at the high school, but it would not be hard to shift to a different model if that's the, the choice and direction of the board. So again, Kerry, um, our facilities manager, will talk about ventilation in a lot more depth than, than I am about to. So I'm just gonna briefly summarize again some of the highlights of that longer document that I shared with the uh, students and parents um, and the school board members yesterday. So things that we are gonna be doing to address ventilation. The first thing I wanna say is ventilation in the high school is a problem. I don't want anybody to suggest that I'm saying or ever will say that ventilation in the high school is not a problem. It is, there are issues that we need to address, uh, both short-term and long-term, no question. Um, open doors and windows, if you look at all the guidelines, uh, that is a simple thing that can be done to, um, to increase air exchange within a space. Um, and my expectation is that doors and windows in the high school will be open. Um, I walked through all the, uh, all the classrooms in the school a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, uh, and then talked with Perry. Um, fortunately, one thing that's gonna help us a lot is over the past three to five years, there's been a um, staged um, uh, replacement of the old windows that were in the high school. So by the end of this month, almost all of the classrooms in the high school will have built-in screens so that not only can teachers open windows, but they can do it um, uh, and, and have screens there. There are uh, several classrooms that will not have screens built in and Perry and I are working on a plan to, to make sure that that's possible um, in a workable way in the, in the classrooms that don't have screens currently. All of the classrooms do have openable windows. So open doors and windows is one thing before and after school ventilation for air exchange. And until the pandemic hit, and really until this fall for the last bunch of years as an energy saving measure, 
our ventilation system was tied to the occup occup occupancy of the classroom. So when a teacher first walked into a classroom in the morning, there were sensors that detected the presence of, the, of people and that kicked on the ventilation system. So Perry has worked with uh, the folks with, from Siemens and Mechanical Services, I'm not sure exactly which it, what, which it is, to essentially disable those sensors and make sure that we have air exchange in all of the classrooms in the building um, from well before any teacher sets foot in the building to well after any teacher leaves the building in the evening. Um, we are, we will be having out, outdoor spaces for teaching. Uh, there will be two, two tents going up side by side um, in the parking lot that's at the end of the arts and technology wing. Um, that is happening. That, I think that tent is, in, those tents are scheduled to be installed on September 3rd, I believe. We are also expecting that teachers will be making use of other spaces in a very nice campus that we have. Um, and we are looking into getting awnings um, so that we can produce some more shade for sort of classroom size spaces. Um, Perry and I have talked about that and Jeff Thorick and Nate Carpenter and I have all walked the campus and uh, begun doing some planning for that. And there's some creative ideas that I, I think will come to fruition. So, our intention is to make maximum use of outdoor spaces for teaching, which becomes particularly um, doable, especially, and you'll hear about more from Noel Hara, the technology director about this. We are expanding, they are expanding for us, uh, the, the reach of Wi-Fi so that it will reach a good chunk of our campus outside, essentially from the front lawn sweeping around back to Hannaford Field. Um, so that encompasses a wide amount of space. Um, we do anticipate outdoor trans transition between classes. Um, we do anticipate using space creatively. Um, today, Nate Carpenter and I talked for a couple of hours about classes that are going to need to be re relocated. Um, some, um, and in some cases, that's, that's relocating to larger spaces in the building. We've talked about how we can make maximum use of the large spaces that we do have in the building, where typically speaking, there is greater ventilation. And so we have a, a tentative plan for how we can do that. And it was time well spent. And I will just conclude by saying, Perry, as I said, we'll have lots of other details um, because as he said, People go through, he's walked through, and he's had consultants walk through um, the high school, school board meeting, and I know that he will be sharing updates about that. Again, that's fairly brief. Um, it hits the highlights. Um, I'm hoping that because of the document that I sent out, it's okay to, to be brief and, and do, do this as a highlight chair. I'm certainly happy to answer any lingering questions that people might have. Thank you. Thank you for those highlights. Um, I do think it was okay to be brief considering that you did send out, send out that document. Um, I'm wondering if um, that document I know was shared with board members and it was shared among high school families, but if the general public wanted to see it, would that be possible maybe to post it? I think it, or? May, be, I think it may be on the district website. And Somebody? Okay, great. So if anybody wants to refer to that, go ahead, Donna. It's under, on the disc. It's under supporting documents for tonight's meeting. Oh, of course. Of course it is. So the, um, just to clarify for those who aren't familiar, um, and I believe you might have said this, but it was a question answer document that um, Jeff had put together with some of the most common questions just to, there's a lot of detail and, and information there. So no need to repeat it. Um, I did appreciate those highlights. If there was any other comment or questions from board members, I'm looking for hands potentially raised. I see Elizabeth and then Kimberly. So go ahead, Elizabeth, and then Kimberly can go after. In the interest of um, trying to help things move along, I haven't raised my hand after every principal speaking, but I am incredibly grateful to each of them for providing this um, information to us. And so, Although I'm going to talk to Jeff, I want to thank Troy very much and Jason as well. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for the document that you sent out yesterday. Thank you for all your communication with various parents, including 
my husband and myself and understanding. And I agree that, you know, educated people can come to different conclusions. Um, and I appreciate the, the willingness to, that we're going to just try to go forward and, and fix what we need to fix and improve as we go along. Um, I think the one thing about our plan at the high school is that I hope we can reclaim some instructional time as we go along with understanding that, you know, teachers need a lot of planning time to start out with and students may need more support time. But as we move along, um, I think many of us hope that we can reclaim some instructional time and it may be um, uh, I use the word naive very cautiously, but I don't believe that we should um, necessarily count on um, AP exams being modified this year necessarily as, you know, many schools are going to try to find ways to make sure that they cover all that content. So I just want to kind of raise that, that hope. And I, I felt it in your letter that there might be a possibility of reclaiming some instructional time. I hear that from Donna as well. I just want to voice that and thank you again. Um, as a board member, I'm feeling much more reassured and feel like we've really gotten the information we needed. So thank you. You're more than welcome. And, and I certainly would not be opposed um, at some point along the way as comfort levels develop, if we can reclaim some instructional time, then I would not be at all opposed to that. Um, there are some, it, it's, it's something that needs to be coordinated across the three schools, uh, but I'm you know, we've already talked about it as administrative team as a possibility at some point. I see the superintendent nodding your head as well. So um, no commitments, but it's very much an issue that's on our radar, believe me. Kimberly, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and uh, yes, I will just um, take a moment to thank um, all three principals um, for the, excellent um, effort and hours and hours that they and their staff have put in this summer. It is greatly appreciated. And um, as you've all said, nobody has done this before. Um, so it's, you know, creating a brand new wheel. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I've heard from quite a few people who really appreciated um, the answers that you sent out yesterday. Um, Jeff, I think that, that was uh, very well received. Um, I wondered if you could speak at all. To, I know in the um, elementary and middle school, there's an intention to keep a specific pod of kids together. And I don't believe that is possible um, in the high school. And um, I just wonder if you could speak. It, it, do you have any idea? Um, I, it, I don't know how how um, how kids is there going to be overlap I guess with you know some kids in period two and one and um, together or is it just a whole new kid new group each class that they go to I'm sorry this was not a very <laughs> well posed question but no I know I know exactly what you're getting at uh, Kimberly I get <laughs> it um, and I will say that really the and I'll start off, this doesn't directly answer your, well, it doesn't perfectly answer your question. But again, the major driving force behind the proposal for a mini term schedule was health and safety in the, in the sense of reducing the number of students who cross through any particular classroom during the course of a week. Um, that's why the proposal came on the table. And after a lot of discussion, that's why it gained the, strong consensus of the of the committee that was looking at this it is not the same it was definitely not the same as pond cove where students are mostly with one teacher all day or the middle school where students are with two or three teachers in one day it is different um, the only way we could have created pods similar to that is by really paring down our offerings in the high school making them much more generic um, and I'm not sure in the end that that's a trade-off that anybody would have been willing to do assuming it was even possible to do it um, uh, and kids kids would lose a lot of opportunities that way um, so there will be transitions um, 
there will be fewer transitions uh, that's, than, than what students face during our regular high school schedule. Um, and because they're only meeting in four classes per day. So there are fewer transitions, but the students are not, the students who are in period one with Mr. Lupian are not necessarily going to be going to period two with Ms. Yarrington and then period three with Ms. Bach. That's the, the, the diversity of offerings that we have at the high school. And I think, and I think frankly, any high school, um, it, it's just really not possible to do that and still offer a rich variety of offerings to students and, and meet those needs. So is that, a, is that a compromise? I guess, but I think it's the compromise that probably all high schools are making. Um, okay. I'm not seeing any other questions for Jeff right now. Heather, I think Nasser um, put his hand up. Right. Oh, Nasser, I'm sorry. It's not showing up on my screen. Go ahead, Nasser. Thank you for that, Donna. Yes, um, Nasser? I'm losing my hand since Jason spoke. So I'm going to ask all my questions now. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, thank and you. And the, the easy question, the, the in reference to the outdoor. Um, for Jason, um, and I guess he doesn't have to answer, it's just a suggestion. Um, we should try to create a, we should not try to have policy. When the, whenever the weather is good, the teacher should have the freedom to grab the kiddos, go outside just to walk. I mean, because they don't get that chance at home. I mean, they don't interact with other kids and that's education in itself. Grab a pencil, grab a paper, identify trees, identify whatever. So, um, one does not need a settings, in my opinion, and don't need necessary tents. It's not time to get tents. It's not time to get chairs and chalkboards to put it on the tent. It's, it's, we don't have that time. Um, so same thing for Jeff. Uh, I, hopefully the tents that you guys bought under the parking lot or on parking lot is going to be pretty hard. It should be utilized on the grass, first of all. And I hopefully, are you thinking of putting furniture there as well? desk and chairs, or what is the purpose of a tent in the USA compared to what is the purpose of tent in Afghanistan, for example? So, so first of all, I will say that um, we are not, not, not alone among schools um, uh, looking, to get, looking to get tents to create, to, pr to provide some flex space that is by nature well ventilated um, in fact, uh, when we were making calls to see what was still available, they were almost all gone because other schools are going to be using them, um, including some very nearby schools who have um, gotten a lot of them. It's really an opportunity. I, I think as, as Mr. Carbon and I were going through the, the needs today in terms of spaces, it, it's really an opportunity to go out to go outdoors in a well ventilated space to give the kids and the teachers some fresh air. Um, and there may be a couple of classes that are, are may need to go into the tents. The only outdoor spaces that we would consider putting any furniture in Nasser are are the two tents. Um, we're not considering putting up um, tables and chairs anywhere else around the campus, we were only considering getting some awnings uh, that we could attach to the building to create some more shade if we can do that because it can be really hot in September, um, particularly. So, um, so that, that would be, the tent would be the only space uh, where we would anticipate doing that. I do anticipate that teachers will, uh, will desire to go outside a lot um, and I think the tent, particularly because it's, it is completely shaded in, provides a unique opportunity uh, for them to be able to do that, I would say. I could, you know, so that, that's, that's my best answer for that, Nasser. Thank you. Did you have other comments, Nasser? Are you good? No, I'm good. I'm uh, just will talk to Perry, maybe one on one, suggest okay. some ideas of uh, what lawn chairs to use and so forth. I mean, when we go to soccer field, 
we are, everybody brings their own chair, right? And that bends in, that's the rollable, and people can still do that. We have a really nice benches at Fort Williams. We have the wedding area at Fort Williams. We have infinite ideas on fields uh, to utilize it. We just need to put our brains around it. Great. Thank you, Nasser. Um, so thank you, principals. Uh, moving on to our facilities director, Jason, um, Jason excuse me, Perry. You would I, like. I, I just want to say thank you to Jeff for helping me out explain things. Sometimes I can dive into things a little deeper than I need to, and it ends up getting a little more confusing than it has to be. Um, so uh, just going back to what he had, had mentioned in uh, his description of what the school would look like, um, we are going to be, at the most part, the air quality in our schools is going to be better than it ever has been before uh, due to the amount of um, change of controls that we've done and also the increased air intake from outdoor, uh, yeah, basically solid amount, 100% of outdoor air. Um, and like he said, typically a classroom has what's called an occupancy sensor. And what it is, is it turns off the ventilation for energy reasons when there's nobody in the space. Those type of things to allow the system to turn off have been bypassed for now and, and until we move a little further into this, uh, into the colder season. But uh, this will allow our systems to be completely controlled solely by schedule. And, and that schedule is yet to be determined. They might, the, the buildings might run 24 hours a day or they might take a break during the night and start up early in the morning. Either way, there will be a purge prior to uh, anybody arriving to the school and we'll continue that purge into the evening after everybody has left the building. Um, that pretty much explains it in a nutshell. If anybody wants more information on how the details of how it all works, I'd rather get into that one-on-one because -on -one it can confuse some as to the complexity of, of how our system is controlled. Um, focusing on, I, I believe, the bigger topic when we left Tuesday, um, I did want to report that we did correct the air in the nurse's office at the high school. Five additional vents were added to that space with literally hardly any problem at all um, and, and no change to the central office in the quality of air or the amount of air they get in that space. Um, so the 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 nurse's office in the high school is where it needs to be permanently. Uh, the, the hallways on the second and third floor, I had reported that we did not have any air in those spaces at all. Um, after, after our meeting, I went back to my office, not that night, but <laughs> um, soon after, and pulled the old blueprints to the building. Uh, these are prints that uh, Jeff got to see him firsthand today, something that you got to be very careful even turning the page because they're just that fragile uh, due to their age. But I, in, in the process of reviewing things, I discovered what I, I will call an abandoned exhaust system for the building that runs throughout all three floors from one end of the building to the other. That exhaust system has not been working probably, I've been with the school four years. I was unaware of it. I don't know how long it was not working prior to the start of uh, me at uh, Cape Elizabeth. Anyway, I had a Siemens who was our mechanical contractor uh, come and take a look at the fans and get those fans operating. In those spaces, we have one fan on the third floor yet that still is needing a bearing, uh, a new shaft, and an, a motor. So it's almost a full rebuild. But once that is done, and that is expected to be completed on Thursday of this week, once that is completed, we should be fully operational and back to what I said in the beginning, better than we ever have been before. Um, and what, what that actually does is 
It's an exhaust system. So it's pulling air out of those spaces and completely exhausting it out of the building. So you don't even have to worry about filters or, or HEPAs or anything like that or the air quality coming back in. It is literally taking the air from those hallways and some classrooms as well and just ejecting it out the roof of the building. Um, not, not the most economical energy wise uh, for heat, but we will address that as we get into that season. Uh, for air quality wise, I, I think it's out, uh, outstanding and kind of a, a good discovery. We will be adding a, um, more, ventil more vents to those hallways from that system um, coming up in the next week or so. Um, and I just, I just did also wanted to shout out that I, I did contact David Clay. He is a, a parent and he is also a community member in the town. He does work for mechanical services as a professional engineer. And he came over uh, and, and went through the buildings with me and middle school as well in Pond Cove. And we did some air testing and uh, checking CFMs and how much air is actually coming out of the vents. And we, we spent a, probably a good afternoon taking a look at things and going over the blueprints and uh, just confirming that uh, we think this will be a successful uh, solution to the to the issue. Um, I, I believe that's it. We did. I did want to say that I did investigate Pond Cove and the middle school, and the cla the claims in the facilities report was based on the small number of vents and their size. But we did go through and measure a few within the, the Pond Cove and a couple over at the middle school and did find them to have a decent amount of air flow coming out of those vents. So it's not so much the, uh, that there's not enough air in a middle school or Pond Cove. It was just, they were calling it out as if it was a perfect world, there would be more vents in those hallways, not necessarily more air. Um, just to just spread it out evenly throughout the space. But I, I, I think things will be far better than they were before um, in the way that we're going to be running our schools at the start of the school year. And uh, air quality should be, should be quite good, actually. Is, are there any questions? I, I tend to hit on <laughs> a lot of things at one time, so... Board members, I see Laura has her hand raised. Go ahead, Laura. Um, hi, Perry. Thanks so much for your explanation. Yeah. You know, on, on, um, it's hard to remember everything since the meeting was so, it went so late last, uh, last week. But I do remember there was talks about that, you know, the air quality just wasn't up to standard. The ventilation didn't come close to standard. You said that it's quite good now. Do you feel that it meets standards now with this abandoned exhaust system and that, you know, surveying the vents in, in the hallways and sort of uh, fixing this issue with the nurse's office? Do you feel like we're there to standard or what are your thoughts? Uh, that's an excellent question because I wanted to uh, reflect on that uh, from something I heard previously when others got to comment. Our, our classrooms have to meet an air quality standard and we get state testing done every year shortly after the start of the school year. I can say in my four years with the school, we have never failed to test in any classroom ever before. Now that is a test for CO2. And what it is is a, a company comes in while classes are going on and they take CO2 tests in spaces while those spaces are filled. Um, it's a random test. I don't know where they're going to go when they do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what buildings or what classrooms, but we meet those CO2 tests, um, which makes us meeting standards in classroom spaces. Uh, based on some emails I had seen after the meeting last week, I think there was a little confusion on the classrooms. Um, and I, I just wanted to make clear all our classrooms are, are in excellent shape as far as getting air quality or meeting those air quality standards. 
we have small spaces that have been converted, closets and such like that, which I will be communicating with the principals and those spaces will not be able to be used with more than one person in that space. But those spaces are not classrooms. Okay. Um, it, was, it was really focused on the hallways mm -hmm. and, and what I was trying to explain last weekend. And so just a follow-up question, thank you for that, Perry. When you saw that uh, you took a look at the vents in the Pond Cove hallways and you were saying that you, know, you measured them and they do have decent flow, we got a lot of emails to say that maybe we could bring in some portable units. Do you think there would be a benefit to the portable units or after measuring the vents, do you feel that the, the flow is, uh, you know, would, would uh, be decent enough to get proper ventilation? Um, it, actually, portable units is what got me looking at the high school in a, in a different way. Uh, the only thing with portable units is uh, there's a little, there's a lot of false representation going on with um, those smaller space HEPA filters or air cleaners. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the companies, when they explain how their air cleaners work, they don't get into the most important topic. And that is how often the air can be changed in a space, how many times an hour it, it is changed in a space. Uh, for a classroom, we're looking at roughly about six times per hour. If you took the standard, um, I'll just say like an Amazon purchase and picked maybe their best one, two or three hundred dollars and threw it in a classroom, it, it does say that it's rated for 800 square feet, but what it doesn't tell you is in that 800 square feet, it may only change the air out two times per hour, which, you know, if somebody were to cough or sneeze, that's lingering, lingering in the classroom for, you know, a, a half hour before right. it's actually re removed and gone through the HEPA filter. So, I don't feel there's a lot to gain in the smaller air cleaners. Um, they certainly can be used. I don't feel there's gonna be a harm to them, but it would take a lot of them to do what we need to do as far as, you know, if you're looking to remove a virus with them. Right. But you feel after measuring the vents that the small units wouldn't be of any additional benefit, that the vents, the size is sufficient enough for the amount of time the children spend in the hallways. Yeah, th that is correct. Okay, thanks Perry, I appreciate it. Yeah. I have a question um, just about the exhaust system and I won't get into the details because I don't need to know all those little details, but is it, um, the, uh, um, is it constantly pulling air up in reference to what you just said about the HEPA filters, you know, maybe twice in an hour cleaning the air, is the exhaust system like a continuous pulling air up? That, that is correct. It, it is really just a large scale, like a bathroom fan you would have in your home. Yeah. But, but think on a much, much larger scale. Yeah. Any other questions for Perry? Uh, Kimberly. I, um, I just want to thank you, Perry, for, um, for uh, reacting quickly after the meeting on Tuesday night and getting people in uh, to look at it and taking, taking a second look yourself at the blueprint. And it sounds like, if I'm understanding your description correctly, that, that this actually puts us in, in quite a good position ventilation wise, the discovery of this exhaust system. It, that is correct. Like I said, it, these, these were fans that were not operating previously. Um, I, I, I was told maybe, you know, five, six, seven years ago, they might have been operating at one time. And I believe they were considered to be a little bit noisy. Um, that that is all I, I basically put Siemens on that job to tell them that I need these to be running as quietly and uh, up 
up to par. I mean, if we if we need to replace parts in them, we'll replace parts, and uh, just to get everything up and running and get us through, you know, through the entire year. Excellent. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Okay, we have one more presenter, Noel, to talk to us a bit about technology. Are you with us, Noel? I am. I'm dark. Okay, Noel. It's dark because it's dark okay. in New Hampshire, um, and the crickets are going. And I spent most of my time today inside, so I'm going to enjoy as much outside as I possibly can before. Good for you. So um, after the meeting on uh, the school board meeting on uh, Tuesday, and again, I also have to apologize because like almost everybody here, my days are running into each other and my hours are running into each other. So, but the timeline was, is not as important. Uh, we, met, uh, we met with Jeff Shedd and Nate Carpenter and walked around the high school just looking at what their plans were, not only for how many students and staff members that were going to be at one time, because that's also a consideration, but where they wanted um, access to um, outside Wi-Fi. Um, and also with that, uh, was a consideration of, of future. So let's say we, you know, get out of the pandemic situation and so on and so forth. What can we use the Wi-Fi after that too to make sure? And one of the things is with any type of um, drills, emergency drills that we, we can uh, we, um, conduct at the high school, we also want to be able to have teachers and, and, and staff members be able to communicate with Wi-Fi. So we took a look around the buildings and uh, found out where they were looking for the awnings, where they were looking for the tents, who they were going to put in, what their visions were. And also with the capabilities, as you know, the high school was probably the most difficult part of that because we haven't really touched the, the network in there. And I believe we came up with a pretty good um, solution for four or five Wi-Fi um, hotspots out there um, that will cover that. We then went, uh, and uh, thanks to Perry, and again, all this is a team effort. Uh, Perry lent me a couple of his uh, facilities, gentlemen, and we walked around and said, okay, if we're gonna put holes in this, what do we need for equipment? What do you need for time? When can we do this? And so on and so forth. And we showed them exactly what our vision was. And so I believe tomorrow, um, because we picked a day that was hopefully gonna be mostly sunny, uh, uh, we are going to start uh, putting up the Wi-Fi connections at the high school and hopefully get to the middle school in Pond Cove. Um, at the same time um, as, as doing all this, we went in and we looked at what was available. Our first choices for outside Wi-Fi um, access points were not available. Um, they have about a, like a lot of equipment, about a nine week uh, lag time, but we did uh, procure um, some units that are going to work and going to work well. And so we had that in order and they are, they had arrived yesterday. So that's going to work very well. And that's about where we are at um, the middle school and Pond Cove, those, those places where we had run wire um, in anticipation of doing something outside and a couple of years ago when we ran those wires, they're all set. Um, we again, went over with the facility gentlemen and um, we should be having those in place right after the high school. So everything's working um, probably this week and next week. And that's it. Thank you, Noel. Comments, questions? Okay, I'm not seeing anything from Board members, um, I appreciate all the time that everybody put in this past week to really get us some answers and um, to really move things forward to get us to this point. Um, next, we um, have new business and we need a motion, but we actually have a motion still on the table from last week. We had just tabled it. Um, so I'm wondering, Laura Danino, you were the one, Laura, you made the motion last week. So I'm wondering if you can just remind everyone and remake that motion. Uh, sure. Absolutely. Yep. So I move we approve the plan for reopening the schools in the fall, um, which is the hybrid plan. 
May I have a second? second. I had second. Thank you, Phil. And so now it's time for the school board to discuss. Are there any comments before voting? I can start discussing, Heather. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. It's Laura. That's okay. Um, a lot of times I'm really brief on our school board calls, um, but for this one, I do think that I need to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the very difficult, you know, decision that we, we all are, are, you know, faced with making. And the fact that with this decision, it's literally, literally impossible to make everybody happy, but I think it will help maybe the community to understand my thought process and, and why I'm deciding this way. So it really rested on uh, three things. So the first that really affected my decision making is the fact that the governor, after consulting with multiple experts, gave the state of Maine the go ahead, the green light to open the schools. So that's number one. Number two, I feel like as a state, you know, we've worked very, very hard to get to the place that we are today. If you look at the, the COVID statistics, and I believe me, I look at them every single day, you know, our state compared to the other states, we have done tremendously, tremendously well. So my thought process is if we can't open, you know, who can at this point? And number three, I feel as a school board member that I'm called to serve the community at large. So I have to put my own fears, you know, aside here and look at, you know, what does the community want? And I know that some of the polls, hey, some of the polls were a month ago, but the Pond Cove poll was a little bit more recent. But to me, it seems like through all the conversations that I've had within the community, that the majority do want some in-person learning and that they feel it's very important for their children's education. Um, so that's just the way I'm basing my decision and hopefully it's helpful for the community to know. I know that it is a very, um, difficult decision and definitely not to be taken lightly. And I thank the entire administration for all their hours um, and work that they put into coming up with these very thought out plans. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Hope. Hi. Um, so I, uh, I want to kind of address the concept of, you know, how are we making our decision? And I, I appreciated um, Emily Garvin's comment that we need to point to, you know, what are the metrics? What are we basing this on? Um, and I think um, it, it, we may have been talking around it, I think, last week, and it wasn't sort of set out clearly, but we know we have the governor's green light, right? And we all, we all know what that means. Um, and the governor's green light means districts, you can go ahead, but you, we still operate under the Department of Education six requirements for returning to in-person learning. So um, the governor can say green, but if we said, you know, the buildings were on fire, we couldn't return to in-person learning because we couldn't meet the six, six requirements for in-person learning. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to say, you know, like, my thought process is and has been, I'm listening to the district's presentations on our return to, to uh, in-person learning, and I'm looking at the DOE framework, and I think uh, the six requirements, and um, I think oftentimes we kind of talk past each other and we say, well, there's, there's, the governor said green and the framework is set out and it's clear and we've done a good job planning, but if we don't, if we never look at the six requirements and look at what the district has told us, and say, are we meeting those requirements? So my opinion is we should be able to look at those requirements for each school and say, can we meet the physical distance requirement? Can we meet the mask requirement? Do we have the, the ventilation is mentioned there? And if we can say yes to all of those, we go yellow. And we do that for each school. And I think last week it was proposed that each school is unique. So it is, it is not really fair to say, um, you know, we may decide they all are the same and it's, it's, our outcome is the same, but it really is by building because we raise this concept of the ventilation issue. So at any rate, um, the concept of not voting based on our opinions goes both ways. So some of us may think, oh, there's, you know, the risk is always out there. Look at the schools that are opening in Georgia. I'm really scared. Um, 
And then others may say, well, the numbers are really good in Maine. And I think that's an opinion too. So we can't say we're meeting the framework um, just by saying, well, the numbers are really good in Maine. So I'm okay with not really analyzing the six requirements and making, making the decision based on that. So I just wanna, I wanna just be very clear. I do believe in-person learning is possible to be done safely using the guidance provided by the governor and the, and the DOE. I believe as a school board member, I have an obligation to pursue the path that provides the most in-person learning. That's our, that's our objective and our, our, our reason for being. That's why we're here. Um, I also though believe, and this is why we, why we got to where we were last week, I think at least for me, is that we have an obligation to use diligence when we look at what the district has told us and look at, compare it to the Department of Education six point requirement for returning to school and say, can I say with a straight face, we've met those requirements. So that's, that's where I, you know, I didn't articulate it that well last week, but when I saw, heard Perry say the things he said last week about ventilation, it gave me great pause. Um, and that's, that's how I got to the point of like, I, I'm nervous. I don't see us meeting that framework. So again, it's great to say the DOE gave us guidance. Everything's great. Maine is low numbers. But if Perry says, um, you know, the buildings have zero air exchange, we shouldn't, we can't, we can't in this, with a straight face say we've, we've done the right thing and done a good job. So um, that being said, um, I think that's, that's, that's where we are. And I think we, we, that's my, that's my position as a school board member. I have, may have my personal opinions that, you know, the framework is, was modified to get to where it needed to be to, you know, maybe the framework is too lax. Uh, I may think the numbers aren't as great as they should be, but I'm setting that aside for my, you know, our decision as a school board. Um, and I'd hope everyone would do that as well to say, I don't, just because the numbers are so good doesn't mean we can set aside our analysis of what we need, the requirements we need to make to put the kids back in the school. And I think we owe that diligent uh, analysis to the, to the kids and the adults who are going into those buildings. So, and that's what I think we've done. Um, and so uh, I hope that everyone can sort of understand what, what, you know, that process. And I think if we're all using that framework, those six point requirements, and we can say with a straight face, the district has done the best to meet those, then we can vote. Um, and I wanted to ask, I, I missed, um, I didn't get a chance to ask Perry, but I know we didn't have the PPE and, I, and someone said there's enough PPE. So I just wanna, I wanted to ask a question. To the extent we have an obligation to provide PPE, do we have what we need for the first two weeks of school, say? Cause I know we can't think long-term, we can only think in small chunks. So do we have what we need for two weeks? Is that something Perry or someone can answer at this point? I, I can answer that if that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, um, we did receive a shipment, I believe, um, like Noel said, I'm losing track of days. We have received the shipment from the state, uh, a very large portion of what we ordered close to, close to all of it. Uh, Jennifer and I have not had a time to go through the entire, uh, it's, it's actually four pallets of, of supplies, but I would, I would say that the answer to your question would be yes, because we already had some supplies that we had purchased on our own prior, just as kind of a backup and for my staff as well. Um, but yeah, I, I'll give you a, for instance, I have wall dispensers for hand sanitizer going in. I'm still waiting for everything that I've ordered for those, but we do have one gallon bottles, a large quantity. I, Jennifer might even know the number off the top of her head. Uh, a very large quantity of the one gallon bottles of hand sanitizer um, to take that place until my supplies come in that we've ordered. 265 gallons. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a lot. It's a lot. Okay. So we, we have rubber gloves, masks, uh, 
I believe just about everything we need. That's it for my comment. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Hope. Other board members? Kimberly. Thank you. Um, I hope thank you for uh, for running through your thoughts. Um, I I am in a similar position to where I was last week, um, where I was inclined to vote for hybrid, um, but the information about the ventilation system did cause me to pause. Um, and I'm I'm glad that we did take the week to get the information um, that I think we needed to be able to um, really honestly um, make a good decision. Um, you know, looking at the DOE framework um, requirements for safely reopening our schools, the second um, item identified physical distancing and facilities specifically identifies ventilation. So. Um, I think personally, that was something I really needed to um, to hear how we were addressing, and I appreciate Harry's um, work on that this week. And I, I feel satisfied that we've made um, the improvements necessary. Um, you know, I feel strongly with uh, my decisions that we need to keep students um, at the center of our decisions, and I feel like. We have a fabulous team in our schools, the nurses, facility, technology, administrators. Um, we are so fortunate to have all of these dedicated, smart, hardworking individuals who have put us in a place where we are very well positioned to be able to open as safely as we can at this time. Um, and I think if, um, you know, I, I heard several people tonight in their reports talk about um, the intention to um, continue to assess and reevaluate and make improvements. Um, I, um, I for sure feel very strongly about that. I think being a smaller district, we're able to be a little more nimble and I, I hope we use that to our advantage. Um, I recognize we can't please everyone, um, but we, I think, are offering a choice for families who choose not to send their children into school um, while providing some in-person opportunities for for students for whom that's going to be the best fit. Um, so I, at this point, am in favor of moving forward with a hybrid um, plan. And um, I, I guess I just would second Elizabeth's um, desire if at some point we can take back some instructional time, I would be an advocate for that. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, Phil, you have your hand raised. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I'll go, and I'll, I'll be briefer than I was last week. I do want to reiterate, and, um, and I share all the comments that have been said so far tonight. So I just adopt those. Uh, I'll just say a few, a couple of things that are different from last week. Thanks to Perry for the work he did. That was a um, uh, really quick turnaround, and I feel much more comfortable um, with what we've heard and the work that was done over the week. Um, than where we left that. Um, I also just want to thank um, the many teachers who have written to us and members of the community who have written to us. Particularly this week, we, we, we got a lot of comments. Um, and I appreciate hearing, hearing from everybody because you don't always hear outside of your circles, quite frankly. And I try to reach out as much as I can. But it was very helpful for me to hear where the community was um, and we did receive a substantial number of emails from people. So I want to thank people for expressing your opinions. Um, 
the teachers also have written to us um, and, and I've read all of those and, I, and they have concerns and, and suggestions. And I would just say thanks, uh, it, 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 to, I want to highlight just a couple things, which I think are helpful that Donna and the administrators have done on the calendar. I know that's second on the agenda, but I think it ties in. And I, I just want to thank everyone for being responsive to some of the concerns the teachers had um, on the flex day um, and the additional planning um, for the half day, on which is now Wednesday and a full day, um, when it used to be Friday and only a half day. So that was responsive. Um, you know, we're going to propose to push the opening back and have a roll-in period. And that was something that was asked for. And I agree that we should have done that. And we were going to do that. Um, and, uh, and we're going to have to continue to be uh, more nimble as we go along. This last comment, I'll say, um, um, I think all three principals said that. It's not going to be perfect. Um, we have to work together as a community and be ready to respond. Um, just a very quick anecdote is my mom is a longtime ed tech in a rural uh, northern Maine elementary school. And they started school last week. They go back early because they have potato harvest still, something I had when I was growing up up there. Yeah. Um, and I have checked in with her daily. And, um, you know, she was, she was ready to go back. She wanted to go back. Um, but the first day of school, she, she called me on her drive home and said, I don't, that was not good. Right. They had all the plans and not everything worked the way it was supposed to. And she said, I just want to make sure everyone is ready. And then I got a call the next day and she said, well, that was a lot better. And it's been better ever since. We're going to have to learn every day on how to do this. It's completely new. And we're going to have some mistakes. Um, uh, so we're going to have to be nimble and we're going to have to react. And we're going to have to work together as a community. And that's, that's the only thing I'd have to say about that. So I, I am in support of the hybrid model. I, I appreciate the tweaks that have been made over the last few weeks and months as, to get here. Thank you, Phil. Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, just acknowledge that um, there probably is considerable frustration in the community that we have not voted or come to a decision until tonight. But I believe that every meeting we had and every bit of information that has been shared was necessary. And so um, I am not apologizing for this process, but, but am thankful that board members asked questions and had concerns and, and, and everybody came together and worked hard to give us the information that we needed to be able to confidently say that we are meeting those checklist items because in truth we weren't ordered to open our schools we are allowed to open our schools if we meet those criteria and um so i just i want to acknowledge i i feel it i'm a facebook user i monitor things sometimes it's hurtful to see these things but i pull back and remember we need to have this time we are not automatons just doing whatever we are sentient beings working hard and um, every every decision that we make is really important. So um, I appreciate the time that's been taken. Um, I came into last week's meeting very much conflicted and feel very much confident tonight that the hybrid model is, is what we should do. And I agree, there are gonna be bumps along the way. The best laid plans are, you know, might just go awry, but I feel like we have a lot of community support. We have fantastic um, administrators and teachers, and we'll figure out how to make this work. Um, before I end, I'd like to acknowledge that we have um, quite a bit of differing opinion among our staff, among our community, and, and after the decision is made, um, I hope that we can all come together and do the best that we can do to just make it as successful as possible for our students because in the end this is all for our students so thank you to everybody and i yield thank you elizabeth nasser would you like to speak sure it's always best to go last because i could just say ditto to all of them uh, <laughs> And hopefully my comments will be less. You know, um, we don't have a problem. Uh, and we would have had a problem if all of us wanted to go to school. We would have had a problem then because the space is small. And it's not possible. So it is fantastic that there are 
equal number or as many people who wants to stay home and, and do the schooling at home. So they are helping one another. Those who want to go to school is helping the ones who want to stay home and vice versa. So in my opinion, we don't have a problem. This is a good problem that we have. Uh, so we can offer, as, as the saying goes, give what the people want. We're giving them both options. Um, I would just like to reiterate um, Hope's comment. Geog geography does matter. And we're in Southern Maine, we're in Cumberland County. We interact with international uh, folks, with immigrants and airports closer to us and so forth and so forth. And uh, so therefore there's greater chances of here compared to where a film mom is. So I know that a lot of great, great emails came from teachers and community and I can say great thanks to them. And they did not just voice their opinion, they did their research. Based on the research, they made their comments and their opinion. And at the same time, we are not expert here the, uh, as a, a school board. We, 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 we process information, we process science data, geography data, uh, everything we process it. And therefore, we listen to you, parents, teachers, students, and especially administration. Uh, a great, great thanks to the administration. We do have to remember that they have worked longer hours than the five hours that we work over here. They have worked longer hours than five hours that we worked last week. They, they, they are on the field and they are uh, on a day-to-day -day basis interact with students and therefore uh, they are the experts. Uh, and they have proposed uh, a hybrid uh, system or idea for all of us that's gonna work for the best as possible as the kids uh, for the for our kids. So like John said, Paul said, and uh, everybody else here, this is a problem or this is a challenge for all of us. So let us learn together to improve it on a daily basis. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you for that, Nasser. Um... I want to thank uh, who wrote in the parents, the students, um, the teacher, um, sharing your thoughts and your opinions. And as Nasser just alluded to, um, they weren't just thought out. They weren't just opinions. They were well researched. They were very thoughtful. Um, and I learned a lot and it, it helped me understand a lot. I also want to say thank you to Superintendent Wolfram and all the other administration for the dedication and incredible amount of work this summer. Um, I think uh, today and recently we have been learning more and more um, through the communication about the details of all that work and it's all coming to light for everybody to see. Um, and it is no small task by any means. So um, sincere gratitude to all of you. Um, I also want to thank my fellow board members. Um, I know that each and every one of you has taken your charge as a board member and this vote very seriously. I know that it has not been easy or simple for anyone. Um, and I just, I just have to say how proud I am um, to indeed to work with all of you um, your dedication and passion your willingness to listen and deep desire to do what's best um, for for all involved students teachers community members it's just so inspiring um, and to the community at large I just want to reiterate, reiterate what Elizabeth mentioned um, I appreciate your patience um, I think we all wanted a decision last week. Um, I think we all wanted to, to know where we were headed. Um, and I think that this was very uh, important um, to um, find out more information, to be able to be more comfortable with how, how we voted and where we, um, 
And I, I also recognize that there were on the road, it's been mentioned several times, new to everyone. And so, so pay us forward, Phil Stoller, right? What happened the same day and weapons were, may not be ones the next hour. And so um, I just hope that we can all have patience as we move forward and continue. Um, um, hope kind of um, was out of my mouth when I was thinking through all of this that um, what is our charge? What is our responsibility? And it is not opinion. Um, it is to go on facts. And um, the facts are that we were given a green light. The facts are that they were then, which is not a mandate but an offer to be able to open under certain standards. And there were six criteria. Um, I believe that our administration has proved that we can adhere to those six criteria, making it feasible for us to get students back in the classroom, teachers back in the classroom as safely as possible. I think that was done through uh, Jeff and various members of the committee that came up with um, I keep getting it wrong, but the mini sessions, I know that's not the right word, but the, the small, the small mini sessions, um, minimizing the number of students that teachers in the high school can see at a time because they cannot do pods. I think that is incredibly thoughtful, um, putting their well-being at the forefront of that decision. Um, and I think that safety has been a huge priority and that um, there are no guarantees in life. Um, this is scary for a lot of people. I can understand that completely. Um, but I do believe that we are able to meet, especially from what we've heard, we have better air quality now with this exhaust system that we've just found out about um, through the extra vents put into uh, the nurses' offices um, and through the testing that was done, not testing, that's the wrong word, but um, than we did before. Uh, so I think in many ways last week forced us to think a little bit more outside the box to um, get some tents so that we can be outdoors a little bit. Um, and I am proud of our administration for how they responded to last week's meeting. And um, thank you to Perry um, and to Donna and the other administrators for acting so quickly and getting us that information. Um, so going back to what Hope was mentioning as well, um, I believe our charge is to, to, to follow the facts. And I think the facts lead us to bringing us to a place where we can open in a hybrid version to a degree. There are options for those families who don't feel safe to stay home. I feel very good that we are able to provide that option for families. Um, I really appreciate Troy's comment saying that um, he wants to make remote option equal to in-person. Um, he's trying to find balance. Um, and I believe we all are. Um, so thank you to everyone. And um, with that, I conclude my comments. Um, and I just want to see and give moment in case there's any final thought from board members before we go to vote. Okay, so now beginning to vote. Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Moving on to the next business item. Can I have a motion, please? I move we approve the calendar change proposal for school year 2021, pending the approval of the waiver for required school student days. May I have a second, please? Second. 
Donna, can you speak to the calendar and the changes that were made? I think we've touched on a um, few or several of them, but just to reiterate them quickly. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Donna. <laughs> That better? Okay. Yep. Okay. So we have identified um, Monday the 24th through Thursday, September 3rd um, as teacher uh, training slash professional development. Um, so it would be just uh, the teachers um, those, two, those two weeks and they will be preparing their classrooms as, as you saw from Jason's slide. Um, there may be some moving a furniture that um, needs to happen and they, they'll have to identify um, what, what goes and what stays based on um, the nurses training that they do about the social distancing. So um, there is a lot of work to be done. Plus there are many uh, professional development opportunities that are being offered. Kathy's done an amazing job of planning for those two weeks and those, those will all be done. Those trainings will all be done virtually. Um, and then, um, the 8th uh, through the 13th will be uh, what we're calling uh, student roll-ins. And each, um, each principal will uh, develop a schedule for bringing small groups of students into the school. And they'll be notifying parents of, of what that schedule looks like. Uh, with the Wednesdays, the 9th and the 16th, uh, being focused on um, the students who are in the 100% remote learning um, program. And then on the 21st, uh, we would start our, uh, our regular um, uh, maroon gold instructional um, schedule. Uh, we have moved, we've changed the, um, the PD Fridays and back to PD Wednesdays, and we've identified those on the calendar. Um, it would be uh, September 30th. December 9th, February 3rd, March 3rd, April 7th, and June 16th. Um, so those are the changes. It's very similar to what we had uh, proposed before, but with that, the two weeks of um, training and professional development for teachers at the beginning, and then the two weeks of uh, roll-in, student roll-in, um, with the start, uh, the hard start on the 21st. Okay, thank you for that update, Donna. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Uh, Phil. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just a couple questions. So it looks like the, um, by moving the start date, the kindergarten is now starting at the same time or, am I, or is that, am I misunderstanding yeah. that? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes, and I believe there'll be some time. I know Jason's working on a schedule, but um, a time for uh, bringing kindergarten students in during that, that roll-in period. Okay, great. And the other question I just have is about the number of days of uh, instruction. And I, I understood that that was part of the motion. It was pending a waiver. Could you just explain that and uh, the difference, you know, how many days were, there would be fewer than a normal calendar year? Yeah, so the Commissioner of Education has, um, has told us that they are going to be flexible in uh, the amount of student days that are required. It has, it's traditionally 175 student days, um, but it sounds like we will have to apply for waivers, but that that will not be a problem um, as we turn in our, uh, our calendars. We have to turn our calendars into the state. So as report, we report to them. Uh, so we will be applying for a waiver to reduce the number of student days. We've actually done that before because of snow days. We've had so many that we actually had a lower number, been waived that number. So it's actually not unusual. It's just a different circumstance. Yeah. Are you good, Phil? Looks like, um, okay, yeah, thanks. Awesome. Elizabeth. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. I had a, the same question about, I wanted to know if the uh, the commissioner had signaled any flexibility because you know that's always a good thing to know if we're gonna hope for a waiver so that's great to know and then so I was noticing the the yellow student half days um, PD Wednesdays um, how does that sort of jive with the fact that the students 
are already off on Wednesdays. Uh, they're, I'm so kind of confused about why they're still on there. Oh, so the mornings, uh, we just uh, designated them, I guess. Uh, um, the mornings will be um, devoted to support for students and contacting students. And um, the afternoons, um, again, will be those PD Wednesdays. And that adds all in to the number of uh, contracted uh, teacher days. Thank you. Um, I, since I don't see, there's nothing on here that sort of states that um, every Wednesday will stay a flex day. Is there any possibility as we move down the road that, you know, when we're talking about reclaiming instructional time that we might actually get some of that time back as everybody gets more comfortable we with have, what we we're doing? Talk, we have talked about that. That's great. Thank well, you. We will keep that on the radar, Elizabeth. Thanks so much. Any other questions or comments from board members? Kimberly. Um, I will just, I, I think, um, I guess I'll just premise by, I, I hate the idea of losing student days. Um, and, you know, we're in a pandemic and I think that it is really important to get the teachers into the buildings for some time to acclimate and to get the classes set up in the way that that's going to work. And so I think those two weeks are really important and will be helpful. Um, I, I, um, I'm just, I'm disheartened um, that it, it comes at the loss of education time for our students. Um, so again, piggybacking on Elizabeth's request, um, you know, if we do have an opportunity to reclaim some instructional time, I, I think, you know, especially knowing that we lost time in the spring, um, I, I'd love to see us add some time in this year if we can. Bill, did you raise your hand again? Thank yeah, you. Just, a, just a brief question, um, just because I thought this is the last chance we have to ask a question, uh, motion to adjourn is next. Uh, it was that I know a lot of people have been asking, in fact, even during this meeting being asked is um, when, um, when parents may find out and students may find out about their, whether the maroon and gold and the way that the schedule is going to work. And so I just thought that's one thing that would be nice to address before the meeting is over. Right. So, um, so we completed our data collection from the survey, although I understand that there's, uh, there may be some um, additional people that, um, that apply for the remote, remote uh, enrollment, the 100% remote enrollment after tonight. Um, and we will work with them, certainly, because we're trying to be very flexible. Um, but uh, the list of uh, remote students went out to principals uh, late today. So they will take a look at those and see how that changes um, their, their plans for classrooms uh, with, with in-person learning. And as soon as they make those uh, changes, and I don't think it's going to be a lot of changes, we will get those lists out. Uh, we have 18 uh, tomorrow, and that is the first question that I've written down, um, is when can we get those lists out? So I know people are waiting for them and we want to get them out. Thank you, Donna. And I guess I have to that, um, I guess I have a follow up to that question that now that a decision has been made, just information is just going to start rolling out to families and that there's no designated date of when you're going to hear things just from now on, just keep expecting that information is going to be coming from principals. Is that correct, Donna? That is correct. Yeah, that things have been on hold for this decision and they're, and they're getting ready to just launch. Yeah. And we know that parents, now that the, the decision is made, we know that parents those groupings so that they can plan for childcare and, and their schedules moving forward. So that will be on the top of our priority list. Yeah. Fantastic. Any other comments?
Well, I appreciate the flexibility and um, willingness to um, make some changes in support of the teachers who um, are embarking on a very uh, a year like no other um, with the challenge of learning to do in-person um, teaching as well as um, managing remote, all the various aspects that I don't even know how they're going to do it. And um, I am grateful that we are working and doing a small part to make some accommodations to, to support them with that as they head into teaching our students. So um, thank you for, for proposing this new calendar that for that. Um, okay, so all in favor, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Excellent. Can I have a final motion, please? I move we adjourn. May I have a second? Second. Second. Phil and I always do that. Always the same time. <laughs> you, you take this one. I did suck at the other one. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Heather Altenberg is yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Strong. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.